is that? Dude, what the fuck is that thing? Oh my god. Spencer sat down to talk with Xbox On about the future of the gaming industry, where they sit with exclusives, even bringing up games that haven't been talked about for a long time. Oh, that's definitely a they, them. This is Cole Eastwood. Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to talk about an interview with Phil Spencer where he talked about the exclusivity of Bethesda games, Call of Duty, and what's going on with Hellblade, Fable, and many more games with updates. If you end up enjoying this video, let me know by liking and subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell to be notified, and let's talk about Phil Spencer, the future of Xbox, and those exclusive games. Dude, Phil Spencer recently hot, went to London to check out studios in Xbox's portfolio that are working on upcoming exclusives. Yo, Phil actually stopped into a studio to see if the game's in the song. About time. Like Hellblade, Senua's Saga, Fable, and the long-forgotten Everwild. Ninja Theory had showcased Hellblade 2 Senua's Saga at the end of 2019 with a trailer at the Game <laughs> Awards and has since then given a couple of updates and that people have expected the game to finally be out sometime in 2022 or even 2023. The latest news we're hearing is that there is a playable build with industry leaders at Xbox to see if the game is ready to ship for holiday 2024. Well, Nick, uh, you 2024 holy shit bro how fucking long do they need to make that garbage i'm going to ninja theory tomorrow very good so i'm looking forward to that mm -hmm. um and i'll get to see obviously what we're doing with hellblade 2 yeah. um, and i did meet with with dom at but he he came down to london so it's great to be able to go up to cambridge and, mm -hmm. and see the work at at ninja theory i, I want to call out playground with the rally i think you know, if you know the pedigree of that studio and where some of the creative leads come from, their background in Rally is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think they, uh, I'm a huge Horizon fan. I think they do a great job with open world uh, racing. And Dude, I would hope that Phil is a huge Horizon fan because it's the only consistently good game Microsoft has put out for the last 10 years. I think it's always great when we get a good Rally game oh, on yeah. the platform and the fact that this shows up as kind of a DLC part of Horizon for mm -hmm. people, I think is... Um, it is really great. And then obviously Everwild's in development there. And um, and Louise and Greg and everybody kind of Quiet seeing angels. what's going on there. <laughs> yes, yeah. So it, we do a lot of, of good work in the studios here. If you just think historically. This game kind of looks intriguing, I will admit. I am interested in Everwild, but again, it's another game that we've literally seen nothing on in like three fucking years, so... Yeah, not really much to be excited for. About the role of studios in England and mm -hmm. the role they've played in video games. I shouldn't Scotland as well, when you, you think about games that have come from there. And it's, it's just great to be here and get out with the teams and see what they're doing. Fable from Playground Games is another big title that Xbox has that has been in the works since 2018 and 2019, but has been surrounded by rumors that the game development team has seen troubles with the engine, possibly changing to Unreal Engine 5. Phil talks about where Playground Games is with Fable. Yeah, and it, Fable, funny enough, it was really, I think it's probably fair to say my it wasn't my first shipped game um, when I joined Xbox, but working with Peter on the original Fable, which I, I was able to do, um, yeah, I definitely uh, I have my point of view about what that game should be and watching how the team is evolving it. Um, it's great. And every time we've shown Hellblade, either, either, either subscribe, donate, or get the fuck out. A couple out. times, the team just sets such a bar mm -hmm. for the mocap work that they do, the character work that they do. And they, they've done, they've really perfected that. Why are they doing motion capture for fucking Fable? Dog, Fable is supposed to be like a cartoony ass looking game. Why are we doing mocap for Fable? Oh my god. Dude, they're going to make it like this photorealistic RPG. Just watch. They're going to get rid of all the charm and shit. Isaac Himmler with the 10 months. Uh, Phil Spender needs to crack the whip like bro. Dude, the fact that Hellblade is not coming out until 2024 and the last game came out, what, over eight years ago? Like, bruh. When did that shit come out? Like, 2015? The original one? I don't even remember because it was so shit. But, 
it's been a long time, man. We're coming up on over fucking five years at the very least. Craft for them, I, I think they're world class as a studio in creating a playable character that's so believable mm -hmm. in tr inside and out, kind of emotionally, um, as well as just kind of seeing the physical movement on screen. So if it came out in 2016, then it will have been eight years in development if it comes out holiday 2024. A ton of controversy has been surrounded by the Activision Blizzard and King merger with Dude, the only way that Hellblade was a good game is if you enjoy like brain dead puzzles, generic fucking combat and walking simulation. If that's what you like in video games, then you probably should have bought a PlayStation for one. But second, um please do me a gigantic favor and take a long walk off a short dock. With Xbox and with regulatory agencies fighting against Microsoft and the conglomerate to bring these studios onto their team, Phil talks about the real reason why Activision and their studios have been brought onto the platform. And it's not just about console exclusivity. Really key to point out that it has somehow been over a year since you and- Jesus Christ, man. I could say so much right now. Announce your int interest, your intention to acquire Activision Blizzard. I like how you say it was my interest. Well, I'm like sure I just you decided, walked in one day and went, "Look, hey, lads, I got a little bit of cash in my pocket. <laughs> what should I do today?" Yeah. Dude, she might as well just start snorting like a hog too. Uh, no to bones with the five. Yo, Griff, what's the haps, bro? Just out of curiosity, are you going to stream Final Fantasy 16 when it launches? Most likely, yes. I'll probably buy a PS5 by then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm keen to know what's what's the reaction been like, uh, watching that all unfold as fans around the world respond to this, this news? For us, the logic really started from how do we gain more capability on mobile, both creatively as well as having users. Yeah, that's like the most attractive British woman. But also, obviously, when you look at what Activision Blizzard King is, yeah. the PC heritage there, um, the stuff we can do with Game Pass, I think will be great for the, the, the community and people who are on Xbox. But the real strategic angle behind this was we need to get relevant on mobile, and it turns out that Activision Blizzard King is the largest mobile publisher outside of China. Indeed. So yeah. that's what we got there. Another big question that fans have, especially with all these studios being brought on to Xbox, is what will happen with exclusivity for big games like Bethesda Starfield and the upcoming Elder Scrolls 6, which have normally been on a PlayStation console in their older iterations. Phil explains the approach that Xbox has to keep exclusivity an important part on the console. Yeah, no Bethesda game is ever looking this good. Good. and their ecosystem. Look the other day, we have 58 games in our portfolio that are available <laughs> in the PlayStation Store okay. today. Now we've acquired a lot of those, mm -hmm. like the Doom games and the Fallout games, but even things we're updating like ESO, Fallout 76. Yeah. And so we expect to ha hit a certain level of quality on all of those games, the mm -hmm. level of quality that PlayStation players expect. So that's our goal. And the same thing on PC and the same thing on Nintendo. I don't think I ever said Starfield was not going to be exclusive to Xbox. You know, now you said that people are going to go through and watch hours worth of I know, content. And I'm, I'm, so I like I'm the confidence. Certain, yeah, because <laughs> I think what I said is we're going to take it on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. um, I said we're not going to pull games that are on other platforms. So we'll continue to support the communities of games. And, yeah. you know, as Elder Scrolls Online has been doing their annual drops and their content drops, yeah. those have been on PlayStation, those have been on PC, those have been on Xbox, all the. PC for some of those ships a little bit earlier, but mm -hmm. the console versions ship at the same time. We've updated Fallout 76 on all the platforms at the same time. Exclusive titles in the console space is part of the business. Mm -hmm. All platform holders do it. Um, they're kind of, more than kind of, they are marketing beats for the platform. Yeah. Um, and we see that. <laughs> Shit. Our competitors have a lot of exclusive games. So when we're launching new games, there are certain games that we're going to make Exclusive for us is always a little bit hard because we ship everything on PC as well. But let's just say ship on Xbox and PC and available on cloud. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those won't be available on other competitive platforms. But there's no example in Bethesda of us pulling something away from the PlayStation community that Do they had. Exactly. Or games that people are playing, not us not continuing to update those. Mm -hmm. I'd say the same thing with, with Minecraft Dungeons and with Minecraft 
and we'll do the same thing with Legends when it comes out. As Phil has been dealing with regulatory committees and the media biting back very strongly about if Xbox is going to cancel or shut down their entire division if the deal doesn't go through, Phil has been very forthright about how they will continue to bring the Xbox platform. No, the graphics with Starfield have not gotten much better. Like, they're slightly better, but they're nowhere near as good as Skyrim mods. With consoles and games with exclusivity for many, many years to come. And as he says in this interview, forever. I love us building a console and I love playing in my family room, sitting my butt on the couch and watching, uh, watching the big screen with a controller in my hand and playing. So I want that experience forever, right? That's something I want. So this isn't about a lack of importance in our, the gaming business of hardware. I think hardware is very important, but it doesn't mean that every piece of hardware needs to be completely closed yeah. <laughs> um, or things need to be obviously taken away from other players because that's not what we're doing. The Xbox platform, the consoles, exclusivity in the ecosystem, and expansion to playing their games on almost any device on Xbox Live with an Xbox account is something that is only growing bigger and bigger the more gigantic that this platform becomes. This is the new iteration, a new age of Xbox, which is full of mini studios, tons of great exclusives, high rated first party games, and a big offering that is only going to get more massive as they make big announcements at E3 2023. Xbox is wait till E3 everyone. It's not done and there will be a Starfield <laughs> Direct <laughs> announced Shit, very man. soon and we'll see some like of the biggest games that will land only on Xbox in 2023 and beyond. This is Colt Eastwood. Thanks for checking out this video. Phil Spencer has been... Don't care. Here we go. Yeah. Let's hear the damage control for why the world's most powerful console is getting outperformed by the PlayStation 5. Xbox Series X is the world's most powerful... And fun fact, everybody, I believe Atomic Heart ran better on the PlayStation 5 than it did on the Xbox Series X. And Microsoft literally had the marketing rights for that shit. Powerful console. A statement you don't often hear Xbox repeating in marketing. In 2023, we are moving into a full new generation of games that will only release on the Xbox Series and PS5 consoles. But many development processes and design decisions are rooted in past generation. Xbox has a major problem with game performance, next generation features largely ignored, and a mindset that the full power of the Xbox is not being fully realized. So why are the full features of the PlayStation being fully utilized? Like, hmm? Doesn't make sense, man. The Xbox Series S and X consoles are considered full RDNA 2 with all of the modern feature sets in hardware and software solutions that combine can give well over a 30% boost in performance over the PS5, which then why isn't it? Some experts have dubbed an RDNA 1.5 system. A couple of key ingredients in the modern AMD hardware are tier two VRS, an efficiency feature and mesh shaders, a way to build 3D models in real time in do you know what all this shit equates to? Marketing PR bullshit. Game on Xbox Series consoles. We'll get into the explanation of each of these two RDNA 2 features in just a moment. Tech experts and developers have spoken up about the express advantage that the Xbox Series RDNA 2 chipset has over the competition and the performance gap can be closed with the use of these features and an insight into how developers may choose to skip the proprietary hardware and software solutions that Xbox waited to implement. In Dude, I'm not even going to pretend to know what I know what RDNA means, nor do I really give a fuck. The simple fact is that there's a lot of games where PlayStation 5 is outperforming the Xbox. And yeah, that's about all we need to know. Weaponized autism with the, t the two just got home from work. What's going on? Basically, it's the same excuse we've heard every time a PS5 game runs better than an Xbox game that uh, no one's utilizing the full feature set of the Xbox Series X. Into the Xbox Series S and X. First, let's talk about VRS or variable rate shading. 
VRS increases rendering performance and quality by varying the shading rate for different areas of the frame in view while playing games. This will essentially lower the quality of objects that are beyond view or outside the frame to return more overhead rendering budget and increase quality where it matters most. This is important. Tech experts working closely with Xbox hardware stated, there's a third tier which includes Xbox specific VRS Centroid offset extensions dubbed TRX 2.X, used for tier two VRS and temporal anti-aliasing. The software implementation on PS5 cannot make up for the lack of hardware support. You'll pay extra penalties that Xbox does not. More importantly, you can... Okay, so let me ask this question. If Xbox has this shit and PlayStation does not, but then they don't utilize it on Xbox, but Xbox is supposed to be the most powerful console, if neither console is taking advantage of this... Shouldn't the Xbox still outperform the PlayStation 5 if it's quote-unquote more powerful? This is where it kind of loses me, man. Because, like, if Xbox has, like, all these built-in advantages that PlayStation doesn't have, if you turn off the advantages that PlayStation doesn't have and on paper the Xbox is more powerful, why doesn't the Xbox outperform the PlayStation? Hmm. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there, but, you know, that's like saying that, uh, whatever the fuck, what's that shit that AMD cards use? Uh, FX or whatever the fuck. It's like their, uh, DLSS solution. What is that shit called? <clears throat> what is that crap called? I don't fucking know. FRS? All right. Or FSR. There we go. So, this is like literally saying that a whatever the fuck, 6900 XT is more powerful than a 3090, okay? And even with FSR on, the 6090 XT does not outperform the 3090. That would be like saying that, you know, I, it's kind of like that. I don't know, man. I don't know if I'm coming up with the best fucking metaphor or whatever the fuck, but the point is, if the Xbox is more powerful without all these software tricks, it should be outperforming the PlayStation 5 if the PlayStation 5 doesn't have those software tricks, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Specify if that makes sense. Oski Woski with the 5. I'm kind of curious how Call of Duty will run on the Switch. Yeah, that is going to be very interesting. They'll probably just put COD Mobile on there or maybe like some old 360 games would be my guess. But I'm actually kind of happy most of my friends are on Switch, so COD on Switch is lit. I think it's been a major missed opportunity now having that shit on there. Like, it kind of blows my mind it hasn't been put on the Switch. Seven inches? That's pretty big. And I saw there with the 5, does MW2 and Warzone run better and look better on PS5, even though they marketing of both consoles run the same, then that's funny on Microsoft's end. I'm not really sure, honestly, because I don't really play on either, so I've never really checked, like, the performance. And weaponized autism with the two sounds like Microsoft is lazy or... In I don't even think it's that. It's just, like... I don't know, man. It just sounds like they were banking on developers using, like, these software workarounds to make the games run better on the Xbox, and developers don't want to take the time because it's the smaller install base shading rates per pixel instead of per draw call. This effectively enables variable rate, MSAA, and more aggressive core shading while simultaneously increasing image quality. Put plainly, the Xbox can improve image quality while boosting performance and keeping the draw call frame rate target at 60 or 120 FPS, making concessions in image quality where the player isn't looking. Yes, it just depends on how the titles use them, the developer goes on to say. Like everything, there are multiple ways to solve similar problems. In some cases, a developer will build a generalized solution, which works great across devices, software-based VRS, and in other cases, developers will take full advantage of the unique capabilities that a platform will give them like hardware-based VRS on Xbox Series S and X. Mesh Shaders, another RDNA 2 feature, is similar. 
It is already on the Xbox custom SOC, but thanks to Sony parody, it is almost not gaining momentum. Absolutely, the parody also means it's locked to other features, close quote. The parody that this developer speaks of is the path of least resistance, where game developers will opt to use software-based VRS instead of hardware-based, which is much more performant because the PS5 doesn't have it. Another major hurdle going into next-gen only titles. But see, why would that matter? If the PS5 doesn't have it, and the Xbox is more powerful specs-wise, shouldn't it perform better still? So if the Xbox is a more powerful console in terms of its fucking gaming processor than the PlayStation 5, and both use the same software feature to, like, I guess, down-res the game, but maintain frame rates shouldn't the xbox still perform better like i don't fucking know man that's what i don't like <laughs> that's what i just don't understand with this entire thing like it sounds like the xbox is not as powerful as the playstation 5 even though it has more teraflops because apparently xbox fanboys learned nothing about teraflops last generation and that it does not fucking equal performance in every single case is the Unreal Engine approach to building 3D geometry. This is the battle for primitive shaders on PS5, which is software-based solution for their geometry engine, and the mesh shaders, a hardware solution which is far better for game rendering only available on Xbox Series consoles and PC. Let's talk about one of the more performant rendering features that is hardware dependent on AMD PC and Xbox Series consoles, mesh shaders. Mesh Shaders is a DirectX 2 Ultimate Vulkan extension. This is really the future of Geometry Pipeline by reducing the linear pipeline concept. In early 2020, DirectX 12 Ultimate included Mesh Shaders and implemented them into the Xbox Series S and X. Mesh Shaders will expand the capability and performance of the Geometry Pipeline. Does anyone else find it ironic, though, that Microsoft has all of these features on the Xbox Series S and X, and they themselves have never actually taken advantage of any of it? Does anyone else not think that smells like complete and total bullshit? Like, bro, what game has Microsoft released that has actually pushed the fucking boundaries of, like, visuals? Because Halo Infinite looked like shit. If we're keeping it a buck fitty, bro, that, that shit looked garbage. And the open world had performance issues on console. So that's what I mean. It's like all of this stuff is just marketing PR bullshit at the end of the day. And until you see actual results, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, I don't know how many times we have to go through the same drill where every single one of these tech channels thinks that AMD GPUs are going to outperform NVIDIA GPUs. Every single time there's a new GPU launch because of all the quote-unquote great features that are packaged into AMD GPUs that NVIDIA doesn't have. And when we come to find out, they're not as good. So it just, it sounds like the same fucking drill. People believing marketing hype. And that's a... That's literally it. It just sounds like the endless fucking loop of people buying into fucking PR bullshit. Mesh shaders incorporate the features of vertex and geometry shading into a single shader stage. Halo Infinite has bad graphics. Yeah, it's not a very pretty game. Through batch processing of primitive and vertex. It looks worse than Halo 5 in a lot of ways. Like Halo 5 has better like reflections, texture detail, personally like the art style and visual appeal of Halo 5 is much more next gen if you upresed it. Sees data. The problem with Halo 5 is that it runs at 720p on the Xbox because, you know, the Xbox One was shitty. But yeah, no, I think Halo 5 honestly looks better graphically than Halo Infinite in a lot of ways. Before the rasterizer, the shaders are also capable of amplifying and culling geometry. All of this technical jargon is explaining the 3D geometry rendering that is pulled into raster or the actual visual pixels you'll see on screen in real time while you're playing. It goes on to say the mesh shader output triangles that go into the rasterizer is a set of threads and it's up to the developer 
for how they work. Dog, he might as well be speaking Chinese at this point. Like, what the fuck is he even saying? And the Xbox has an advantage in their simultaneous multi-thread cores. But as we get out of cross-generation, there is the Unreal Engine Nanite, which has become a new solution for building 3D geometry in the PS5 or even the Xbox Series S and X. Epic developed a mesh shader demo for the PS5 called Nanite Virtualized Micro Polygon Geometry, which is a software-based solution that is supposed to emulate what mesh shaders do, and it generates 20 million triangles. Developers say mesh shaders still use the fixed function rasterizer, much like the other hardware accelerated graphic pipelines do. Nanite has two different paths for rendering compressed geometry. There's a compute shader rasterizer for rendering dense micro polygon meshes, and in another path, they can use the traditional graphics pipeline that involves a vertex shaders with fixed function rasterization for larger triangles. Ah, that makes so much sense. On PS5, they actually do use primitive shaders for larger triangles instead of a vertex shader, but they still use a compute shader as well to do software rasterization. I guess. Is this shit making sense to anybody? Because it ain't making sense to me. You could use mesh shaders instead of vertex shaders, they say, if they really wanted to, but there'd be no advantages as the meshes get more dense since the software rasterizer would start to overtake it in performance. Plainly put, the real performant option is to use... I thought people bought consoles for the simplicity and not having to know about technical specs and all that type of shit, right? Use hardware based mesh shaders, which are available in the Xbox Series S and X. The problem is that the PS5 cannot render them unless they emulate it through Unreal Engine 5, and not all games will run on that engine. So, why would a major multi platform developer like Respawn build mesh shader geometry into their game when the PS5 needs an alternative software based solution to draw triangulated shapes for in world objects? The path of least resistance is to use a fix-all for both major consoles and optimize rendering separately. Of course, Xbox's first-party titles on Unreal Engine 5 and other major game engines will use mesh shaders and Tier 2 VRS. In fact, this is likely why Forza Motorsport on Xbox Series consoles is able to offer this level of visual quality with real-time reflections and shadows with DXR, DirectX Ray Tracing, in-game targeting 60 fps the comparisons for big mul targeting multiplats on ps5 and xbox series x will always be there from channels like digital foundry the development kit and procedures for porting games to xbox series consoles are up to speed and no longer the issue hampering performance digital foundry explains that even though the xbox series x is more powerful than the ps5 they are rightly confused as to why the PS5 outperforms in frame rate graphs to similarly spec PCs and the Xbox Series X. Mm. Um, I've actually asked various developers about this, and they've been somewhat baffled by the situation. Uh, and it has been suggested that perhaps, like, one hypothesis is that with the PS5 having its own unique API, whereas Xbox is basically built around DirectX 12, that it might vary depending on which team members are assigned to do which version and there does still seem to be a preference for the ps5's api mm. it is a little bit confusing because even in like uh callisto pro why is it confusing bro it's the most popular console developers are going to build games around that console that's what always happens Tagger Man with the 10 RDNA 2 is the graphics architecture of RX 6000 AMD cards. PS5 and series console both use these in APUs that use an 8C slash 16T Zen 2 Ryzen 3000 CPU. Series S has a weaker GPU for theirs. Yeah, I mean, that's what I thought, is the PlayStation 5 and Xbox had, like, the same architecture, so I'm not really sure why, you know, I don't know, man. This whole thing just sounds like a bunch of bullshit, like, cope, and, like, the end of the day. Like, basically, Colt is upset that, you know, developers aren't taking time to, like, use these super specific, like, Xbox hardware features. When on paper, the Xbox should be outperforming the PlayStation with or without them. I don't know, man. Shit's just kind of above my head, for sure. Protocol. 
That changed a lot. You remember the pre? Oh, weaponized autism with the two, not to mention Halo 6's facial animations. Yeah, I don't know, man. Halo 5, I think, is more graphically impressive. If they actually up that game and, like, next-gen upgraded it, I think it'd look a lot better than uh, Halo Infinite, personally. release version that I first looked at was running, like, sub-20 FPS on Xbox. And then they fixed that for launch, but then it was still missing RT reflections. And then they added RT reflections, but they were, like, much lower resolution than PS5. Mm. When you look at the actual hardware, uh, that shouldn't be the case, right? Like, no. it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Specifically with raid facing, you would expect the, um, the larger GPU on the Series X to actually exactly. do better. Yeah. Right? And it's mainly like, we got to get this out for a certain date. And based upon the fact that every game is patched into oblivion these days, as soon as it's launching or just before launching or after launching, um, that we know that games all come in hot and there's priorities for ones that have a lot more sell date for, for sure. Um, but I think, uh, the two edged sword of Xbox since Xbox one, at least has been, is that it is a direct X based system from looking at developer, um, documents almost essentially we know that you can run basic dxr 1.0 or dxr 1.1 code on an xbox so if you just throw like a dxr 1.0 version of the ray tracing onto xbox series x but for ps5 actually instead due to the fact that it has a different api in total do the low level work that is required right. to even get it running there well then you're going to have two very different scenarios where one where you invested a bunch of work and one where you actually almost just ported pc code over there with not much difference and one will obviously run better than the other because sure, there yeah. was more time given to it one last explanation comes from the perspective of xbox supporting developers to make the most out of the xbox series consoles on games that would release everywhere the primary challenge is that Xbox hardware team can't force developers to use their support. There could be many reasons why, including developers unable or unwilling to take the feedback or help being requested too late in their development cycle, teams not implementing recommendations, last minute feature additions or changes that can- But see, this is the problem, is if developers have to go out of their way to add all of this shit, why are they going to take the time when games sell better on PlayStation? There's less Xboxes out there and the game still works fine on Xbox in the first, like that's the thing. It's like Microsoft added an extra unnecessary step that developers don't want to fucking take the time to deal with. It sounds like, like they made the console hard to develop for. This sounds like the PlayStation three all over again, because Technically, the PlayStation 3 should have fucking run circles around the Xbox 360. But the PS3 was such a bitch to develop for, no developers took the time to actually fucking utilize the hardware. They literally just ignored that shit and got games running and said, fuck it, it's done. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, man, if the game releases, the game releases. They're not going to spend all this time you know, making sure it runs as great as possible if you make it a pain in the ass to develop for. I don't know. Like, that's kind of what this is reminding me of. I style it with the 5. I play Halo's campaign every year. And Halo 5 through... Wait. Through MCC? That's not an MCC, man. Is 4K 60 and above. Absolutely looks better than Infinite. It's really... Do you mean Halo 4? Because Halo 4, I agree, is graphically better than Halo Infinite, 100%, when you look at the upgraded version. But Halo 5 is not an MCC, unfortunately. They need to fucking fix that shit. ...can introduce issues just before launch. But there is definitely an issue of parity as major multi-platform games will choose to skip rendering and performance hardware features that the PS5 does not have, but are available on modern PCs and Xbox Series S and X. Some of these APIs or hardware software solutions are specific to Xbox, Microsoft, and PS5 has an alternative solution for rendering or compression of huge data processed in real time for their games. This doesn't even cover the compression and input output advantages that are exclusive to Xbox series consoles that will be covered in another video. Alex Battaglia of Digital Foundry explained, quote, the truth is in the pudding of the performance numbers. If a game has wonky performance on a modern console, it was not given proper time. The PS5 and Xbox Series X are similarly good. The amount of time given to each is obviously not equal. 
Xbox hardware teams partner as closely with all developers on the platform, but every title, developer, and relationship is different. But the bottom line is that games, like Digital Foundry explained, are lucky to make the shipping date at all and come with an onslaught of post-launch patches. And if more time is spent optimizing the PS5 version over PC and Xbox, these issues will persist. And with DX12 versus Vulkan API battling out preferential treatment, the PS5, although less powerful, will get much needed optimization to keep frame rates and features where devs hope they would be. The problem isn't marketing or a number of more popular PS5s being preferential. It really boils down to the major issue with DX12 and specific features that the other console doesn't have. In the end, none of this matters to gamers enjoying games on whichever console they choose until they do the inevitable and look at the analysis long after they've already chosen their console and already paid for the game. This is Cold Eastwood and welcome uh, give fuck suckers. to the redone back wall of the studio. I've been looking into this Xbox performance issue and I've made so many videos in 2020 and 2021 explaining the express advantage that Xbox... Don't care, didn't ask. All right, let's see if MBG has been on the uh, defensive recently. This is a very big deal for Sony. Sony must reveal... Oh, let's hear this. Let's see if there's some cope. All right, guys. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome if you're new. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check the video out. We have more PlayStation news, rumors, and leaks to go over and cover today. So do me a favor before we dive into these topics. Hit that like button if you end up enjoying the video or finding it. So Grifter is a Sony fanboy now. That's right, man. So much so that I don't even own one. Informative and consider hitting that subscribe button as well if you're new here to the channel. The first topic is talking about the new Sony uh, TV lineup. The 2023 models have officially been announced by Sony and they get some new PS5 exclusive features. This is being reported by PlayStation Lifestyle where they say Sony has unveiled its 2023 Bravia XR TVs, a new range of what it considers the best TVs for PS5. According to the company, those who fork out the cash Will be in for a treat wow what a shock sony tvs are the best for the playstation 5. i wonder why sony would make that claim i saw it with the 10 actually this january 343 said halo 5 will never come to mcc for whatever reason what the fuck? and probably not pc yeah 343 is a massive fucking l uh its campaign is at least fun gameplay wise. My bad, I meant Halo 5 by itself on Series X. Yeah, gotcha. No, Halo 5, I think the graphic engine looks a lot better than Infinite, 100%. When it comes to gaming, as the new Bravia XR TVs take PS5 gaming, quote, to the next level, end quote, with exclusive features, the new range of Bravia TVs are the X90L, which is full array LED, the X93L, which is a mini LED, the X95L, which is also mini LED, A95L, which is QD OLED, and the A80L, which is OLED. They offer auto HDR tone mapping, auto genre picture mode, and a dedicated game menu for tailored settings. The game menu allows players to quickly turn on or off variable refresh rate or VRR and motion blur reduction. Players can also easily adjust brightness, black equalizer, and screen size, among other settings. With the newly added game menu, it's never been easier to fine-tune gaming settings and assist functions, Sony writes. All the essentials are at the gamer's fingertips for on-the-fly adjustments. Uh, and yeah, finally, dude. it says the A95 model comes with a new multi-view feature, which allows players to watch walkthroughs and guides side-by-side -side while... Si yeah, MBG really does fucking hate his life. ...simultaneously playing games so you can tell man very he just sounds there, really but, sad yeah, sony was a little bit uh later than usual with their reveals here of the uh you know new tv models but yeah i'm interested what do you guys think about this what do you think about the new bravia xr uh lineup here dude what the fuck is the point of having picture in picture mode on a fucking tv bro that makes no sense that literally seems just so unnecessary I don't know. Or is it something that you're going to consider upgrading to, or do you feel content with the uh, TV you're currently playing on? Let me know. Moving on to the next topic, we are talking about God of War Ragnarok and how it is officially the most nominated BAFTA game ever. 
uh, which is certainly impressive. It says here, God of War Ragnarok has received a whopping 14 nominations at the BAFTA Game Awards <gasps> 2023. Oh my God, bro. The BAFTA Game Awards. What the fuck is that? Breaking the record for the highest number of BAFTA nominations ever for a game. Dude, what the fuck is the BAFTA? And why should I care? As for other PlayStation either, exclusives, either, either subscribe, Stray received donate, eight nominations, or get the fuck out. while Horizon Forbidden West took five. Elden Ring, one of Ragnarok's biggest competitors uh, for best game, received a total of seven nominations. And it's worth noting that last year, the most BAFTA-nominated game was Returnal, with eight. So, yeah, just wanted to highlight this briefly because, you know, we have seen... How was Returnal the most nominated game for anything, dude? Nobody even played that shit. It sold, like, what, 300,000 copies? Uh, God of War, as well as Elden Ring and other games, you know, be awarded um, since they launched. But this is definitely something that I think is pretty impressive. Like, I have to imagine that Santa Monica Studios feeling pretty... BAFTA equals British Game Awards? No wonder why it's an L. Pretty good right now with 14 total nominations breaking a record. Uh, the BAFTAs are pretty important to developers and Never uh, people heard of within them. the gaming industry. So that's nope. why I wanted to let you know about this. They're not very important. No one fucking cares or knows about them. Next up, talking about God of War. Apparently, Final Fantasy 16 draws inspiration from God of War. This is what the... Yeah, the classic... God of Wars. Director is revealing again from PS Lifestyle. It says Final Fantasy 16 gameplay draws inspiration from God of War. Director Hiroshi Takai has said Takai revealed that he's been a fan of the Santa Monica Studio franchise since the first game released on the. Thank you. I was a fan of the first game as well, so I'm glad they're drawing inspiration from the OG God of War games because those were the better ones. PS2. Speaking to GameSpot, Takai explained that Final Fantasy 16's structure is similar to God of War and that it has a hub that will lead players to the main scenario quests. The hub area will also give players access to locations that they've unlocked in order to complete side quests and other missions. Players can choose to continue with the main story or tackle side content that they've unlocked. This hub is called... Hi nah, David Jaff likes the new God of Wars. He just doesn't like the direction they took Kratos as a character. Right away in Final Fantasy 16, and it's where a lot of the game's RPG elements come into play. There is a shop, a blacksmith, NPCs, a hunt board, and much more. Hunt board is described as something that gives players clues to certain locations in the world map where they can hunt notorious marks. Yeah, Final Fantasy 16 is going to be fucking god tier, man. This game looks so good. Materials and rewards. To say that there's no influence of the series God of War on me and this game would be a lie, Takai added. So... Yeah, had to let you guys know about this because I think that's certainly something that is likely making everybody who worked on uh, God of War Ragnarok feel pretty good considering, you know, how beloved uh, and long-standing a game series like Final Fantasy is to hear that the latest iteration is actually taking inspiration. Wait, where is this video that David Jaff says he hates God of War Ragnarok? I would love to fucking watch that. Is that like a video? I would love to check that out from the you know more recent God of War games. I think that's actually great because I loved God of War 2018 and Ragnarok. So yeah, they're speaking my language here. But moving on to the next topic, we have a crew tagger man with the tier two membership. Big ups, man, appreciate it. Nice Tyler with the five or Sony TV is worth it even for PS. Mm, I'd get LG or Sa Samsung. I mean, honestly, like Sony TVs are kind of, they're kind of washed. Like. Sony's TV division has been taking L after L after L after L. I don't know. Personally, I would get an LG or a Samsung. I mean, if you're going to go for an LG, make sure you get like a high-end OLED. And if you're going for Samsung, obviously get a QLED. But yeah, Sony TVs are just like a lesser LG OLED, basically. So if you're going to get an OLED, you might as well get an LG TV. And if you don't care about OLED, get a Samsung QLED, which really the only advantage for like a Samsung QLED is I think the uh, viewing angles, right? But personally, I like Samsung TVs just because I like the like interface and shit like that. But really, you're not going to go wrong with an LG or a Samsung. But Sony TVs, they're kind of like washed at this point. Crucial up. But yeah, I think, I don't know. 
I think Sony TVs have like a lower refresh rate, but if you're playing on a TV, does a refresh rate really fucking matter? Like, it's not going to matter that much. Like, the input lag or whatever the fuck it's called. It's got like a lower response time, whatever that fucking statistic is. But, I mean, if you're playing on a TV, I highly fucking doubt you even give a shit about that in the first place. Date to the ongoing Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition uh, pertaining to Sony. Apparently, Sony must reveal PlayStation exclusivity deals in the Microsoft Activision case. This is what the FTC is ruling. Again, being reported by PS Lifestyle, Sony has suffered its first defeat in the ongoing Microsoft Activision case as the Federal Trade Commission, or the FTC, has ruled that it must reveal its third-party PlayStation exclusivity deals. To fight off the FTC lawsuit over its impending acquisition of Activision Blizzard, Microsoft subpoenaed Sony demanding a- Dude, the thing is, is any TV is technically bad for gaming. If you want a gaming screen, get a monitor with a one millisecond response time. Otherwise, you know, pretty much any TV sucks for gaming, is what I'm trying to say. All of them have terrible fucking input lag. Groovy with the two, what do you think are the best TVs? Uh, Whatever that 8K TV from Samsung is, that's what I would get if I were to buy a new TV. But, yeah. I don't know what it's called, actually. Let's see. Samsung 8K TV. The Samsung Neo QN9008. Or 900B. Uh, here we go. Uh, why can I not click on it? Does Samsung not want me to buy an 8K TV? Yeah, for the low price of $5,000 which you can wait and they go on sale all the fucking time you can pick one up but they always go on sale so never pay full price for a Samsung TV they always go like half off around the holiday season a laundry list of documents that it felt was relevant to the case this included personnel files of PlayStation executives and third-party exclusivity deals in response, Sony filed a motion to quash or limit the subpoena, accusing Microsoft of obvious harassment. Unfortunately for Sony, FTC's judge mostly disagrees. Quote, the nature and extent of SIE's content licensing agreements are relevant to the complaint's allegations of exclusivity arrangements between video game console developers and video game developers and publishers, end quote. That's exactly what the FTC ruled in response to yeah, Sony's no argument shit. that going through decades worth of files and business records is an unnecessary burden. The FTC reduced the date range of documents required. Microsoft had requested records from January 1st, 2012 onwards. The FTC has limit, limited this to January 1st, 2019 onwards. What the FTC did grant Sony, however, was its request to withhold employee performance reviews and evaluations. Microsoft claimed that such personal data might candidly discuss the information it requires. The FTC disagreed. So this is certainly an interesting update when it comes to, you know, PlayStation's involvement here. Obviously, Sony doesn't want to have to give any of this information over, but I have to imagine that surely uh, their legal team informed them that how is 8K trash? That makes no sense, bro. In what world is 8K trash? I, I just want you to think about that for a second. How is 8K a resolution higher than 4K trash? I, I just want you to think about that for a second because that literally makes no sense. That's like saying 4K is trash because we have 1080p. That there's a good chance they're going to have to give this information over considering they are pushing back so aggressively against this. And what's interesting about it is I can't help but think to myself, you know, Sony has not revealed virtually any first party uh, exclusive games in the past year. But what they have been doing is revealing a ton of third-party exclusive games. Games like Silent Hill 2 Remake, Rise of the Ronin, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, obviously the upcoming Final Fantasy XVI, and uh, games like Death Stranding 2, and the list just goes on. 
And I almost have to wonder if this was done strategically. Maybe their lawyers informed them quite some time ago that, hey, you know, if this gets taken to court, um, you may have to give them this information and let them know about your exclusivity deals. Maybe this is why Sony decided to reveal so many at one time. I'm not saying we know about everything. I'm sure there are no, some deals no, 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 no. that have yet to be announced and talked about. They have not revealed everything because they knew this was coming. This probably hit them by surprise. I don't think they were expecting this shit. They got drawn into this shit and, you know, they kind of overplayed their hand. Now they have to, like, basically reveal their hand. And Sony will obviously have to... Uh, make the FTC aware of this. I do wonder if we, the public, are going to learn about any of these deals um, or if this is going to remain kind of under wraps. But that's just the first thought that kind of ran through my mind because it's like, well, it sounds bad, but realistically speaking, I think we all kind of know what Sony does with these Norman exclusivity Fetus. deals, right? Like we look at Final Fantasy VII Remake and see that hasn't released on Xbox yet. Damn, why does Hard he have pants Final on? Fantasy XVI will. Uh, maybe games like uh, Silent Hill 2 Remake will. Uh, what about Rise of the Ronin? You know, Death Stranding probably won't. But yeah, you know, it's interesting nonetheless. So wanted to give you guys this update, and I'll continue to update you when it comes to anything involving Sony and this ongoing situation. But next up, we have Sony making it clear that they want to make PlayStation the best place to play third-party games. This is coming from Push Square, where they say third-party exclusives are becoming less common these days which means platform holders like what? Sony need to find third party exclusives are becoming less common these days, bro. Y'all motherfuckers literally have more third party exclusives than anyone else in the industry. It's savvy ways to entice players into their ecosystem. This can be done. One executive says by making PlayStation the best place to play in an interview with games industry. Biz head of third party portfolio and acquisitions. Sean Benson discusses, some of the reasons why such arrangements are less common nowadays and said there's room for exclusives where it makes sense, obviously, but really the focus, especially with a digital distribution model that is more prevalent than in generations past, is that there are different types of gameplay out there. As the industry grows, so too does the breadth of experiences available to the gamer, and a one-size-fits-all approach won't work for everything. Benson explains, for example, a free-to-play games business model is most successful when it's on as many platforms as possible and brings the biggest audience possible. Still, when the opportunity arrives, Benson says uh, what is more important than any exclusivity deal is making the PlayStation version of a game stand out as being the best. And this can be achieved through a skillful application of existing tech. Benson asks the question, uh, what kind of innovation can they apply with the haptics in the dual sense or the adaptive triggers? What could they do with the 3D audio and the sound design of the game, etc.? So there's a lot of things we could do and then create marketing stories around. And that's where some of these partnerships for multi-platform games really focus. So I wanted to cover this because it's not too often that we hear an executive at PlayStation talk about their approach to third-party uh, deals that they make. It's interesting because they're seemingly downplaying. Yeah, it's interesting how they don't mention the fact that they pay for exclusive content in almost every single game they have a marketing agreement with. You know, we focus on controller vibration and audio, but no mention of, you know, locking content behind their platform. To a degree, the third-party exclusives that they have and the deals that they make, it's understandable why they would downplay it at a time like this. They're talking about how they really try to work to make it so that some uh, games, the best version is on PS5. We've seen them do this with big third-party titles uh, time and time again, most recently with a game like Hogwarts Legacy. This is a multi-platform game, but we really saw how Sony was very aggressive in trying to really you know, leverage anything they could and market this game in association with PlayStation, and I'm sure it's, you know, done really good things for them when it comes to how it's maybe pushed sales on the uh, PlayStation platform. Oh, definitely, bro. I, like, saw hundreds of those videos of, like, people's girlfriends going to fucking GameStop or whatever, buying a console with the game. And guess what consoles they were buying? PlayStations. So... Yeah, no, I mean, PlayStation does a very good job with their marketing messaging and getting people to want their console, and the third-party deals definitely help with that. That's why Call of Duty was such a bad fucking loss for Microsoft when they gave up those marketing rights. So, 
yeah, you know, you guys let me know your thoughts on that. But moving to the final topic here, we have a report from VGC. Uh, the title reads Xbox Series X and S has sold 18.5 million versus PS5's 30 million. This is what an analysis firm estimates. In a newly published review of the console market in 2022, Ampere analysis Pierce Harding Rolls estimated that 18.5 million consoles had been sold by the end of last year. At least when it comes to Xbox, Harding Rolls notes that while sales of both the PS5 and Xbox Series X were held back due to ongoing stock shortages, Xbox managed to slightly increase its share of unit sales over the past year due to the more widely available Xbox Series S. However, he notes the level of demand for Series S during the holiday season, even with pricing promotions, suggests that it does not have the high-end pull of its bigger brother. Last month, Sony announced that it was now much easier to find a PS5, claiming that its hardware shortage was coming to an end, while Microsoft has yet to make a similar claim for the Xbox Series X. As the Xbox Series X has never really had an actual shortage outside of the first couple months. Let's be honest. Like, you've been able to find Xbox consoles, whether it be a Series S or X, pretty fucking consistently throughout this entire launch window. PlayStations are just now becoming readily available. As such, Harding Rolls predicts that the sales gap between the PS5 and the Xbox Series X and S will continue in the first half of 2023, at least until Xbox Series X shortages end. Elsewhere in his analysis, Harding Rolls claims that Microsoft's share of the gaming market, combining sales of hardware, game content, and subscriptions, grew from 25.5% in 2021 to 20. Yeah, I mean, the best measure of how available each of those consoles were is just look at the resale prices of them, which I was actively watching for over a year. So, like, I was always keeping, like, kind of a finger on the pulse of, like, the resale market. And the more rare something is, the higher the price is. The Xbox dropped out of the profitability zone pretty fucking quick after launch. You only had, like, a couple months to make money off of uh, scalping them. PlayStation, on the other hand, for over a year you could make money scalping them. So, yeah. 27.3% in 2022, while Sony's dropped from 46.3% to 45%. Griffin would sell water to a whale? I don't know, bro. If I was selling shit to a whale, I'd offer him a Coke or some shit. How do you think they got that fat, right? Ha ha ha. So I wanted to discuss this with you guys because there are a couple of interesting things I think that we're getting from this. Uh, the first being that, you know, the PS5 is uh, currently outpacing the Xbox Series consoles, which is not a huge surprise. I don't think anybody, you know, is surprised to learn this information. But the thing that I'm paying attention to is how uh, this analysis, anyway, seems to focus on the fact that Sony talked about the shortage ending for the PS5 and then goes on to imply that the shortage somehow didn't end for the Xbox Series X. That's very strange to me. Uh, they even say that they expect things to change in the second half of 2023. Griffin would sell his body for money. It would take a lot of money. Be, um... I don't know. It's weird because I'm not sure how Sony could get their hands on these components and, you know, announce that, hey, there's no more shortage, uh, but Microsoft can't. It doesn't really make much sense. To Dude, Stellar Blade is going to be top tier, bro. I'm looking forward to that. Me. But something else that I did want to point out here is that we look at the market share and it's not, I don't think it's really working in Microsoft's favor at this moment in time because. Microsoft is trying to make the argument to regulators that, you know, Sony is just completely dominant in market share and they're not growing, they're shrinking, that being Microsoft. And when we look at this, it does show that they are in fact growing. They grew uh, by not a substantial amount, but still a noticeable amount. And Sony did drop. So that kind of works, I would say, in Sony's favor. But Again, considering the percentage is so small, I don't know that it's really going to make a huge difference. But nonetheless, this is kind of an update we're getting. Uh, getting some numbers out here on, you know, how well the PS5 selling versus... New generation with the 2, 2x speed. MBG's killing me with his voice. Well, Otaku Daikin kills me with his superior intellect, so... Fucking suck dicks in an Olive Garden bathroom is the xbox consoles either way i think they're both doing good 
which you love to see. And I hope that they both continue to sell really well because, you know, we want to see a healthy. Look at that. Sony says Call of Duty helps fund first party games. Hmm. It's almost like that's what I've been saying for a year. Crazy. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome if you're new. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check the video out. We have more PlayStation news, rumors, and leaks to go over and cover today. So do me a favor before we dive into these topics. If you end up enjoying the video or finding it informative, be sure to leave it a like. And if you are new here to the channel, consider hitting that subscribe button as well. We're starting here with a story regarding PlayStation Plus and how it helped one developer with its game uh, really reaching a new level of success and gaining more experience. I need to play this shit at some point, bro. Deep Rock Galactic actually looks pretty cool. I bought it a long ass time ago. Exposure. This is coming from PlayStation Lifestyle where it says Deep Rock Galactic's PS. Dude, MBG talks like he's trying not to wake his fucking mom up in the next room. Honestly. No, his voice is so empty, lol. Huh, just like your bank account, Brit. You're broke! You're fucking poor! Plus release contributed significantly to the IP's success, according to its developer, Ghost Ship Games. CEO Soren Lundgaard revealed Deep Rock Galactic is goaded if you have friends or do co op. Fuck. This in a recent earnings call held by Embracer Group, which owns Deep Rock Galactic's publisher and parent company, Coffee Stain. A cooperative first person shooter, Deep Rock Galactic is Ghost Ship's debut game and the only title it has released thus far. Deep Rock Galactic first released on PC in 2020 with positive reviews, followed by its PS Plus release in January of 2022. We broke all our records on player numbers and revenue, Lundgaard said, of the game's full release. We entered into play- The game does not look like a PS2 game. It has stylized graphics. PlayStation Plus and very, very fast 10 million- I have no problem with a game having an art style. This does not look old. This does not look like something that would run on like a fucking PS2 or some shit. It's just like ultra stylized graphics. Players claim the game. Started playing, enjoying the new season content, buying the cosmetic DLCs, and just had a really good time together. And this propelled the Deep Rock Galactic IP even further into closing into mainstream. So I just wanted to share this story with you because it's interesting. We don't hear too much about these deals that Sony makes with certain developers for PS Plus games that release monthly, but at least for the developers of Deep Rock Galactic, it proved to be... Yeah, Hi-Fi Rush does look like a PS2 game. Even with that ga like game's art style, like that art style looks like shit. Games have done that art style better than Hi-Fi Rush. A uh, very... Cactus Productions with a 2. I'm playing Deep Rock Galactic right now. It's pretty fun, even by myself. All right, cool, man. I'm glad I don't have to have friends. Wise move on their part and something that helped them out tremendously. But moving on from that, Thank we have God. an interesting article regarding some things that Sony is saying about Call of Duty in regards to their AAA first-party titles. This is once again being reported by PlayStation Lifestyle. They say Sony has made a new revelation that first-party games like God of War, Horizon Forbidden West, The Last of Us, and Marvel's Spider-Man may not have existed if it wasn't for Call of Duty. The claim came in one of the supporting documents submitted during the latest round of arguments over Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. While the exact figures were redacted in the report from the CMA Phase 1 responses, Sony claims Call of Duty players spent at least around $1 billion on PlayStation hardware, peripherals, subscriptions, games, and other PlayStation services. If these players left PS5 for Xbox, it would reduce Sony's ability to invest in future hardware and games. More specifically, it would, quote, reduce the potential return on producing innovative first-party games, thereby diminishing SIE's ability and incentive to invest in new games, end quote. In other words, games like God of War would be far more unlikely to exist without the presence of Call of Duty. So when I hear this from Sony, I do understand where they're coming from. Call of Duty makes them a ton of money. And so for them to take a portion of that money and invest it into their own studios and their own IP to help grow it, yeah, it makes sense. But do I believe for a second that games such as God of War, etc. wouldn't exist without Call of Duty? No, I don't. If we look at a game... Yeah, it's a fucking load of bullshit. Like God of War Ragnarok, for example, 
That is a complete load of fucking horse shit. They're just trying to make themselves look like the fucking victim. The game made Sony a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money. It certainly made back the budget for not only the development of the game, but the marketing as well, and is likely making Sony a good profit. The same can be said for a lot of Sony's big AAA games. So I don't believe this. I don't think that Sony would not be making these games as big and as great as they are um, if it wasn't for Call of Duty. Again, I understand why in this given circumstance, Sony might try to not necessarily make that argument directly because that's not exactly what they're saying. They're just simply pointing out that the money they make from Call of Duty uh, allows them to you know, reinvest into their studios and their games. But I firmly believe that they would continue doing that even at the scale that they are right now. Dude, it does not surprise me that Pentiment got 10 out of 10 reviews. Games journalists love games that they don't have to play. Even without Call of Duty. It's just there would be a greater risk involved and I think that's the biggest thing to kind of take from this is that having Call of Duty there, specifically the money that Call of Duty makes PlayStation acts as a bit of I saw there with the five. How much are Sony games anyway? Imagine God of War and Last of Us 2 wasn't G. I have no idea how much money goes into the budget of a video game, honestly. I don't know. That'd be kind of interesting to see the breakdown of like actual development costs versus marketing costs and everything associated. But I don't think there's ever been like an actual financial breakdown that we've ever seen. A safety net to a certain degree, uh, you know, when Sony decides to invest in these big games. So let me know your thoughts on that. Moving to the next topic, we're talking briefly about Rise of the Ronin. Because I know, like, Sony spends a shit ton of money on marketing, which is why their console is so popular. Is because, you know, they put it in front of people all the fucking time and make it something that people want to buy. This is being reported by Gaming Bolt, and it says Team Ninja has delivered two excellent Souls-like action RPGs with Neo games in recent years, with another one launching imminently in Wolong Fallen Dynasty. But it looks like the studio will be deviating with a very different and seemingly much more ambitious game next year. Rise of the Ronin is in the works exclusively for PS5. It's being billed as an open world action RPG and as it turns out, it's a game that has been in the works for quite a I thought we weren't getting third party exclusives anymore, Sony. A long time. This was revealed by Koei Tecmo in a recent interview with Famitsu, confirming that Rise of the Ronin has been in development for as long as seven years, with production having been running concurrently to the aforementioned Wo Long Fallen Dynasty in addition to DLC projects. As per the company, development is at its peak right now, and the project seems to be on track to launch in its previously announced timeframe. So uh, it's a pretty small update for Rise of the Ronin, and I think that they. Dude, graphically right there. Timeframe. So. This shit looks like Assassin's Creed 3, and that is not a fucking compliment. This shit looks exactly like Assassin's Creed 3 right here. Like, almost fucking identical in terms of graphics. And that is not a compliment. That shit looks old as fuck. Peter Parker with the two, MBG is a clown. I agree, man. Uh, it's a pretty small update for Rise of the Ronin. And I think that they implied previously that this game was in development for a very long time. Something else I do want to remind everybody is that uh, PlayStation's ex-dev team is actually assisting um, Koei Tecmo in the development of this game. And that's what gets me most excited about it is just knowing that this is going to be their biggest, most ambitious project. I mean, obviously, every developer usually says that about their upcoming game, but I feel like you know, when they come out and they say, look, we've been working on this for seven years, that definitely gives you an idea of just how big this game uh, really is going to be. So let me know your thoughts on that. Moving on to the final set of topics, we're talking a little bit more about Final Fantasy 16. We have <gasps> even more information. All right, we already heard about this shit. What's that? Yeah, wait, what's this? Expect. But now we're continuing to talk about why they chose to do an exclusivity deal with Sony. I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. The money. Some interesting answers that Naoki Yoshida gave this time. It's talking about why they entered into an exclusivity agreement with Sony. And it's actually a pretty interesting answer. And we're learning uh, more about the overall development of this game. So the first question is regarding the PC version of Final Fantasy 16. During a broadcast, your comments became a topic of discussion. Please, could you tell us again? 
So Yoshida says, firstly, for Final Fantasy 16, due to the timed exclusivity contract with SIE, we cannot release other platform versions for six months after the PS5 version is released. I suspect many people probably don't know why we enter such contracts. And then this is followed up with Money. another question. From the player's perspective, I think they perceive it as something like it is for the hardware manufacturer to sell its own hardware during the contract period. And then Yoshida answers no by shit. saying, of course, I think there is also that kind of intention on the hardware manufacturer's part. However, from our point of view, the technical support we receive from the hardware manufacturer is a big factor to signing such contracts. This time, there was a portion where we were developing together with Sony Interactive Entertainment engineers who know the hardware thoroughly down to the core, and we received generous support and optimization that we could not manage on our own, and so on. Also, by not developing on the premise of multiple platforms, we can invest more man hours into things such as building the game and optimization. In addition, we can also do promotions together globally that this make me wonder how so much fire, would this be bro. if it was converted to money. Technological and promotional support are things we would like to receive if we can receive them. So this is really in. Yeah, Square Enix is more like. Give me money! 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 interesting because we don't really get insight ever into why you know some of these big AAA developers or even you know with smaller developers and indie titles why they choose to yeah dude the menu scrolling fans can fucking cope and see the all they want this is definitely the direction final fantasy should go in like why the fuck would you ever want to scroll through like menu after sub menu after fucking uh sub menu when you could just like actually play the fucking game right you generation with the two you see whoa long has mostly negative reviews does it on what on steam i'm assuming that sounds like a steam term whoa long uh top sellers i would imagine it would be on here right oh shit Damn. Joystick emulation at launch. The keyboard and mouse remains the same as the last demo. That's to say it's laughably bad. The performance on NVIDIA display cards is a disaster. Uh, keyboard and mouse controls. And fuck those who says just use a controller. Problem with sensitivity. So it sounds like people are bitching about mouse and keyboard. Uh, most recent. I can't afford this shit! Interesting. I wonder what the actual reasons are, because I highly doubt most people are trying to play this shit on keyboard and mouse. Do you get it early if you pre-order or something? Like, how are they already reviewing it? Huh. I don't like the control scheme, personally. I think the controls are fucking terrible in that, but, you know, to each their own. I'm sure people will say, oh my god, you just suck at the game. Like, yeah. No, I just don't like the controls. Like, I'll admit I suck at a game and still enjoy it. Like, Dark Souls, I fucking suck at until I get the hang of it again. You know, that didn't stop me from finishing Elden Ring. Like, shit. <laughs> like, you know? I don't know, guys. Like, if you guys remember when I streamed Elden Ring, it took me, like, how many fucking hours to beat, uh... Margit or whoever this fucking name was. Was it Morgoth or Margit as the first guy you fight? I know it's the same guy, but did he call himself Morgoth or Margit at the beginning? I don't remember. But, yeah, dude, that shit took me fucking forever. But did I actually, like, you know, go, oh my god, bro, fuck this game? No, because it felt fair. I just had to learn it. But, yeah, this game, I just don't like the controls. The fucking dodge and block button being the same button is very fucking annoying. I think that's a terrible design decision. I Siler with the five. Nothing is worse than being over encumbered in a game. And oh yeah, fuck the weight system in Skyrim. That shit's annoying. What is Woe Long at on Metacritic? 
Whoa, long. 81. Uh, what's that? That's on PlayStation 5, PC, 82, Xbox, 80. Yeah, so it just kind of seems mid. Yeah. I don't know. What was Neo? I'm just curious. Neo Metacritic. Neo had an 88. So, yeah, people just don't like this game as much. Interesting. To, you know engage in these exclusivity contracts with sony and we have naoki yoshidi here basically pointing out that yes of course it's going to help sony and they want to do it because it's going to move ps5 units everybody knows this it's not a secret at all but he also goes on to explain that it really is the not only the development support but the marketing support as well that is a huge difference maker aka give me money money money, money, money. In the eyes of a lot of these developers and even you know publishers like square enix so some very Bro, this interesting game looks stuff so there, but fucking the final fire. piece of information regarding final fantasy 16 that i have for you this actually comes from a translation uh from genki japan over on twitter and he says final fantasy 16 producer naoki yoshida said that Final Fantasy 16 was optimized for PS5 with technical support from SIE, and at present it would take roughly a $2,000 PC to be able to have a similar experience on, eh, that's not that bad. on PC. He continues by saying he is talking about at present, if they had a fully optimized PC version, I imagine it would run on lower cost PCs, but for now, without full PC optimization, it would take a high-end gaming PC to run at a similar level of performance to the fully optimized PS5 version. So I just wanted to kind of throw this in here at the end. Uh, I don't really care. Sounds like I could be playing it right now. What the fuck? I don't care about the broke boys. Flexing on the broke I saw there with the five, dude. This boss battle looks like God of War three. I should pre-order now. It really does. Like it gives me like it looks like Devil May Cry, classic God of War. Like it has that cinematic flair that the old God of War three boss fights had, where you would have like the actual combat encounter, and then you would have the QTE portion of the boss fight where you'd like finish him off. Like honest, this game looks fucking great. Because, you know, yesterday we heard... Like, this is the type of game I enjoy. And the fact that it's not fucking open world is even better. Heard, um, you know, a designer from uh, Square Enix who worked on Final Fantasy 16, basically talking about the PS5, its overall design, and how it helped with the game. But uh, now we have uh, Naoki Yoshida just straight up saying, like, yeah, right now in the current state, you would need a $2,000 PC. And that's... Um, you know, that's that's pretty interesting. I, I don't think he's being paid to say things like this. I think he's just being honest. Uh, he literally is paid to say things like this, but he probably is being honest because the game's not optimized. Just in saying that, look, we... Crazy how that works, but yeah. Sounds like they need to send me over the PC copy so, you know, I can be... Flexing on the boat. So all the little motherfuckers out there with 1060s and shit can cope and seethe while the real... PC Master Race enjoys this game. We have not optimized for the PC. Meanwhile, we optimized to the nth degree for the PS5. So, yeah, I think that honestly, PS5 owners are excited to hear something like this because Final Fantasy. Also, Square Enix's games on PC are notoriously badly optimized. Like Final Fantasy 15, till this day, runs like absolute shit. 16 is you know as a ps5 only game and uh just kind of hearing that this much effort has went into making sure that they can do yeah pc comes out six months after everything and take full advantage of this hardware i think you know it's very exciting to anybody who is looking forward to this game and uh you know bought a ps5 but that's gonna do it for the video guys i hope you did enjoy it i hope i'm gonna be picking up my ps5 pretty soon or not pretty soon but well, I guess it is kind of soon. This game comes out in June, so probably sometime in May I'll aim to pick up a PS5 in preparation for this game. So within the next two months, I will once again be on the God Station 5, bro. Let's go. Hell yeah, dude. I'll no longer be a PC gaming virgin and troll, bro. Look at this shit, man. The creator of Sonic is going to jail. I saw this earlier. I didn't watch it. 
That's fucking based, man. Hopefully it's for tax evasion. This video is so ridiculous, you're going to assume it's fake. I mean, it just seems too insane. The creator... Griffin, will you ever stop flexing on the brokies? No, dude. Oh, fuck. I gotta pull up the video. Give me a second. Give me a second, guys. Please understand. I must find the video. I can't afford this shit! Besides... Alright. It's time for our enlightenment for the evening. Ready? Besides supercars, flexing on the broke boys, and building an empire, everything's overrated. There you go. That's all you need to know, guys. Besides supercars, flexing on the broke boys, and building an empire, everything's overrated. So, if you ask if I'm ever going to stop flexing on the broke boys... I mean, until I get supercars and, you know, have built my empire, I don't really foresee it happening. You know? Because everything else is completely pointless. Besides supercars, flexing on the broke board, and building an empire, everything's overrated. Traveling, I'd love to go traveling. You'd love to go to Spain and sit in a hotel, walk around the street, have a coffee, have a cocktail, look at a shirt. And then you'd like to fly to Italy. Go to a hotel, have a coffee, walk around the streets, look at church. Woo! Traveling! Geek! True, man. Geek. That's why I don't travel. Instead, I stay... Flexing on the boat! Weaponized autism of the two who uses a 1060 in 2023. Do they live in Belarus? Yeah, I think I'm key does, actually of Sonic the Hedgehog is going to prison and in my opinion for the stupidest reason ever but let's talk about that what's up gamers dreamcast guy here hi hope you're having a great day if you could like this video and subscribe if you haven't already now real quick just in case you aren't aware of it this is think about it the Icon of Shiva is your stepsister? Director of Final Fantasy 16 must have seen Oromo. Let's hope, man. We need some family values back in video games. Is Yuji Naka. In a lot of people's minds, he is the person that created Sonic the Hedgehog. He did the programming for the original games. He used to be one of the heads of Sega, just working at Sonic Team. He is a designer, a producer, and a video game programmer. He made a lot of big, influential pieces of art that people still love to this day. I mean, he is very, very critical to creating the blue blur. But later in life, uh, he started to work on some games that kind of sucked. He did good stuff. He did, uh, you know, things like Nights into Dreams. And then he did Balan Wonderworld, <laughs> what is often considered to be the very worst game ever made. This Yet he still went out and bought a PS5 copy for it. This game is something you give to people if you don't want them to be your friend anymore. That is legitimately how freaking terrible this game is. Well, currently... Then why did you buy a new copy of it? He is in court, and he... That shit's still in the plastic. You could hear it. At least he didn't open it. He has just pled guilty to insider trading. <laughs> so... Fucking based, bro. Let's go. He really is a gamer. Basically, what happened... Nothing but respect for my boy. Dude, these politicians get away with insider trading all the fucking time, but when a normal person dares to fucking do it, all of a sudden it's a crime. Fuck that shit, man. Free our man. Fake crime. What happened is that... <laughs> it's so silly. Basically, inside of secret meetings held at Square Enix, they would take him into a room and say, Hey, you're Yuji Naka. Here's what we're currently working on. Do you want to try and get in on this? This is like, you know, the major next projects that we're going to be releasing to obviously get his feedback. Maybe he's going to program it. Maybe he'd be an advisory role. Well, 
the two games that apparently happened were when they were making Dragon Quest Tact, which is like a tactics game, and Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier, with both of these what happens specifically is they said, hey, we're making these mobile games. Here are the studios that are going to be helping us with it. And with both of them, he secretly went and invested about $20,000 into each of them and ended up making $145,000 profit. What he did, it, which that monster it was 20 million yen. Oh my God, dude. What a monster. How could he? Uh, basically, he put the money into it. The games are announced publicly. The value of those companies skyrocket because they're obviously partnering with Square Enix. And then suddenly he sells that stock and makes some big buku bucks. Now, this it's not even a lot of money. This is extremely illegal. This is so only because he's not a politician. Super illegal here in the United States. It's illegal in Japan because it's called in. It shouldn't be illegal. Because, bruh, if we're going to punish only one group of people for doing it and not the main offenders, then yeah, fuck that. Not a real crime in my book. Insider trading. It means you're using the secret information you have to make a bunch of money that a typical random person couldn't make. Well, he admitted there is no doubt that I learned about the games before they were publicly announced and I bought shares in them. Yuji Naka admitting to insider trading charges at the Tokyo District Court. Now, the freaking case is ongoing because he has not been fully uh, tried in that they have not given him a sentence. They have not told him how much time he's going to spend in prison. But, I mean, the Japanese legal system is pretty dang harsh. Um, there is extremely, extremely... Yeah, just another common Japanese fucking L. Low crime rates in Japan. And part of the reason for that is because if you get busted for stuff, they really do lock you up. They put you away for a long time as a sort of symbol. Everybody else, don't make the mistakes that this guy did. So the fact that he is just admitting the guilt outright, props to him. Maybe, maybe they'll give him a mildly reduced sentence, but I think there is a good chance. Weaponized autism with the two who knew the creator of fucking Sonic is this based? I know, bro. It makes me want to be a Sonic fan now. He is but I'm not autistic enough, so sorry. Ain't gonna happen. Going to be spending years in the slammer. But additionally, I'm kind of curious personally how this is going to affect his legacy. You see, in Japan, in the past, there have been a lot of examples where a person is busted for some sort of crime, sometimes as minor as drug possession or something like that, and they completely remove every piece of art you have ever been in, including major video games. A recent example of this is when Judgment was about to come out. Uh, it was out there, it was on store shelves in Japan. One of the lead guys caught sniffing a little bit of expensive nose candy, and then suddenly, oh, shit. bam, they literally took the games that he had already been in off the store shelves re-edited the either, either, either subscribe, game donate, or get with the a fuck different out. face actor, removed all of his audio dialogue. I mean, the, the links they went to to fully remove him from the game, I am... Yet Japan won't take the same lengths to remove child porn off their fucking store shelves. In fact, they gave everybody a one-year grace period to enjoy it while they can. But yeah, you know, just another common Japanese L, bro. 2023 Perfect Dark with the one month. Yep, I was just about to say that. Meanwhile, actual pedophiles are getting lighter sentences, basically. I'm kind of curious if they're going to do that with Yuji Naka. And what I mean by that is Who that... Who cares, bro? He's already got his fucking money unless they take it all. of his games obviously are already out. Uh, if you play anything like Sonic Generations, a lot of his like big uh, classic compilations things, you know, not just like uh, Sonic Origins and stuff like that. Games that are a mix of older Sonic games. The ending credits say, this is the game series made by Yuji Naka, or special thanks to Yuji Naka for you know, making Sonic the Hedgehog 1, 2, and 3. 
I am a little bit wondering if they're going to digitally remove him from the credits of all future Sonic games. If, <gasps> if everything that's out, they'll take him out of the credits. All future games, I, I bet you, I bet good money, they're going to remove his name from any future Sonic projects, even if they're already deep into development. This is freaking wild. Because let's face it, the real reason that Yuji Naka should be in prison is because of Balan Wonderworld. This game is a sin. This game is <laughs> easily one of the worst things I've ever played in my life. It, it's like somebody tried to make a torture device and it just happens to be wearing a top hat. I am still just absolutely stunned, but I have to laugh because uh, imagine getting arrested for Final Fantasy VII, The First Soldier. The First Soldier, okay, it's a Final Fantasy Battle Royale, so it was never going to be that great. But it's baffling to me that the game is already dead. He invested in that company, made his short-term profits, took that cash out, and now is going to prison after the game is already dead. This man took the biggest L of all time for a Final Fantasy... Nah, dude, his only mistake was he wasn't a politician before he did it. Battle Royale. Man, Yuji Naka, this has besmirched your legacy. And I feel bad about it because, honestly, I do think a lot of people sort of deify. Yuji Naka has proven himself to be a true gamer. I have nothing but respect for the guy. He needs to be fucking freed because he committed no crime game makers people like Hideo Kojima or you know people like a uh, uh, freaking Nolan North I don't know people the director of Starfield Nolan North who the fuck is that field uh, freaking kid no Ken Levine is Bioshock oh god I'm spacing oh god Todd Howard <laughs> can you tell I didn't sleep Gaming. much last night Todd Howard but these are still no Timothy Marco with the two he should identify as a politician in court yep they'd instantly free him well, people even They'd say if, our apology, sir, please leave. People are making the biggest, coolest games. They still make human mistakes. And in this case, yeah, uh, he made the biggest mistake of all. Goodbye, Yuji Naka. I hope your sentence isn't too particularly long. But man, that is a uh, that is a hell of a mistake to make. Well, what do you guys think about this? Are you curious about how somebody could take such a fat L? On Final Fantasy The First Soldier, tell me your thoughts in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a big ol' thumbs up, share it with your friends, and- Nolan North is a voice actor? No, oh, I don't give a fuck then. Subscribe if you haven't already, and please keep dreaming. Also, off topic, I've been playing Octopath Traveler 2. Holy heck, this story is fantastic. Dang! People say, oh, it looks retro. It's not worth 60 bucks. This game is worth 60 bucks. It is absolutely worth every penny. I'm going to binge the hell out of this. <laughs> Bruh. Thanks so much for watching. Dude, I wish I could honestly experience such enthusiasm that Dreamcast guy has. It is kind of like a, you know, nice thing to see someone be very happy. If only I could relate, bro. I just want to feel. But yeah, nah. Watching that video. If you want to see something I'm glad else, the outro is back. Click this link to see what I put up last. Or, you know, subscribe and see what's coming up next. Also, I... Nolan North also voiced Deadpool in the Deadpool game. And Desmond Gay Miles in Assassin's Creed 3. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't give a fuck about voice actors for the most part. The only voice actor, oh shit, I'm trying to think. I mean, Dinklebot was pretty cool, but I don't really care about him as a person. Um, the only voice actor I unironically like, and that I maybe would want to like, maybe get a sh thing like signed by, is the motherfucker that voiced um Jiraiya from Naruto, because that dude's a fucking legend, man. That motherfucker is a legend. Other than him, I can't really think of anyone. Because that's like one of the few cases where I feel like a voice actor made that character. Because if you listen to fucking Jiraiya from Naruto in the Japanese, he does not sound right. 
But in the English version, he sounds really good. So that'd probably be it, honestly. I can't really think of any other voice actor that's really like stood out. I'm trying to think, man. Like everybody else is kind of just generic. Nobody really has like a very distinct voice, I feel like. I mean, may oh, I mean, obviously, like the motherfucker that plays Darth Vader, James Earl Jones. I would love to like get something signed by him, but you know, he's gonna be dead soon, which is a rip. But yeah, other than that, man, I can't really think of many uh, voice actors I actually care about. Palpatine's not a voice actor, bro. He's like just an actual actor. I don't know, man. I'm trying to think. Like, what are some other iconic voice actors I really like? Um, true. I need to get a signature from Yong. Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Yong out. The one from Bayonetta. Hell yeah, dude. I hear she needs some money. You know, I'll I'll pay her two fifty an hour for her to sign something in three seconds. Right? Which what would that equate to? Like fucking nothing. Like twelve cents. <laughs> I don't know, man. I'm trying to think, man. I can't really think of many other voice actors I'd want to have like something signed by. Yeah, I think James Earl Jones and then the motherfucker that plays Pervy Sage in Naruto. That'd be about it. Honestly, like no other character has like an iconic voice in my opinion that I've heard. I can't afford this shit. Isaac Himmler with the two. Roger Craig Smith as Ezio was goaded. Yeah, but even then, I don't really feel like Ezio's voice was anything that, like, defining. Like, Ezio could have had a lot of different voices, and he would have been just as likable. I'm talking about, like, a voice that, like, made the character. Like, Darth Vader, obviously, made the fucking character. Uh, Pervy Sage, he made the character. Um, I don't know. Master Chief. Eh, I don't really care about Halo that much, story-wise. Maybe the motherfucker that uh, screamed Granada in uh, <laughs> Call of Duty. There we go. There we go. That's a pretty iconic voice. Is this it? Oh, uh, they're not gonna actually play it. Damn, bro, I thought it was gonna be the voice line. Guess not. That's a shame. Merc with the two guys like Keith David literally made our childhoods. Who's that? I'm not familiar with him. Uh, HCM 101 with the two. Steve Blum. He played Zabuza and Orochimaru. See, I don't really like the Naruto dub. The only characters I like in the Naruto dub are Jiraiya and Pain. That's it. But pain isn't bad in Japanese either. So, I don't know. I don't really think pain's voice is very defining. Like, his Japanese voice is just as good, in my opinion. Whereas, like, Jiraiya in Naruto, like, his Japanese voice actor fucking sucks. Hold on, let's see if somebody has a comparison. Jiraiya, English... 
versus Japanese. Yeah, let's see. Let's see if we get that quick comparison. It just doesn't fit, bro. I don't know. It just doesn't fit. Where's the English guy? No, is this... See how bad that sounds? It almost sounds effeminate. Where's the English guy? Can't wait. No, I've still got some fight left in me. You don't know when to quit, old man. What's the point? If I can defeat just one, fine. He just sounds so much cooler in English. I don't know. And usually it's the complete opposite. Like, the thing is, with most, like, Japanese voice actors, a lot of times they give the characters, like, deeper voices for the male characters. And then a lot of times in, like, the English dub, they have, like, this fucking, like, high-pitched, like, fucking child-sounding voice. Whereas it was like the complete opposite for Jiraiya in Naruto. So that's like the one example I can think of. He just sounds better. But yeah, I don't know, man. There's not really many voice actors I give a shit about, to be completely honest. Because almost any character could be voiced by anyone. It's just whatever voice you're used to. With like rare exceptions. I mean, obviously like Darth Vader is like defined by his fucking voice. So, yeah. I think that's a pretty clear example of where a voice actor actually made a fucking difference. Do you like Madara? I've never heard Madara in English. So, I couldn't tell you. Love is War Beat Dub? What the fuck does that even mean? The MK11 Thirst Trap? Oh shit, let's watch it real quick. Hell yeah, bro, Iron Man. Why did we need to click on this shit? <laughs> Hell yeah, bro. That was so sick, bro. Marvel skins. Oh, now I'm going to get a bunch of Marvel shit in the recommended. Those are cool, bro. Those big cats. If I were to get a cat, that's what I would want. One of the main coons. Like, those are really cool. Those are really fucking sick. They act like dogs, too. My cousins have one, and it's really fucking cool. Yeah, I'm gonna get a bunch of Marvel bullshit in my recommended now. Marvel. Uh, Bill Clinton with the two. Pain and Jiraiya are my favorite part of Naruto. Yup. And they completely ruined the entire Pain arc by having Naruto talk his way out of the situation. Even after getting his fucking ass beat. But, you know, literal plot armor saves him. Just like every other time. Yeah, you should have gotten a main coon, bro. Those are really fucking cool. That padding video is facts. Which one? Where's the padding video? What do you mean padding video? Anyway.
All right, here we go. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do when I come for you? Nobody must be no brigade. Policeman, they get no break. Oh, oh, soldier man, I get no break. Uh -huh. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Last month, all right? It was an interesting month. First of all, it was the shortest month of the year. February, you know, there's only 28 days as opposed to 30 or 31. So you got a few less days. And also, let's be honest about February. It certainly was not a bad month. I absolutely under, uh, understood that there was not a lot of new games released. I mean, Hogwarts was really the biggest one, Hogwarts Legacy. And there's a couple others here and there. You know, I was finishing up Dead Space, amongst other things. You know, ongoing continuous playthrough. <laughs> He keeps looking at chat because there was this one guy swearing in Russian, I think. I mean, February had more games than just Hogwarts. I mean, DSP Wage Quit from uh, Atomic Heart. And then what was the other new release game he stopped playing? I forgot. What was the other game he stopped playing? I don't fucking remember. But yeah. It's like, there's been two games this month, and then there was the Destiny DLC, which he'll never play through, but, you know, this month, actually, or I guess I should say February, because it's March now, but, yeah, there was actually pretty decent releases. Oh, and Like a Dragon, there you go, too. That was the one I was thinking about. So, February unusually had a lot of video game releases. He was like, like One Piece, right? <clears throat> oh, really? King Gokin, was it something stupid and offensive so I could ban the person? Because I don't want to, but if it was something stupid and offensive, I'll just get rid of them. Let me know. I mean, you're a moderator. You you judge for yourself if you think what they said was super offensive. King Gogan says he ran the statement through a Google Translator. <laughs> and now he's like, uh, oh boy. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> last month, I had a lot of fun, all right, but. We didn't get enough tips and memberships. 2023 Perfect Dark with a 5. Mortal Kombat mods are just not even close to being just as good as Dead or Alive mod. Well, yeah, you have a little more physics, if you know what I mean, to play around with. Uh, but MK12 might rival Dead or Alive. Looking forward to modding MK12. When does MK12 come out? I haven't really heard anything about that. You guys had a lot of fun. Mortal Kombat typically has pretty good tra uh, trailers, so that'll be neat. But... I have to keep saying, but there honestly was not tons going on except for my new channel, DSP Reacts. Let's be honest. There was Hogwarts Legacy. Great. It was hype for like a week. Everyone was excited. My views on my playthrough were great. And then what happened was Hook everyone was like, okay, now we know Hogwarts Legacy. I think it was Mortal Kombat 10, which had like the rap song in the background, and you had all these fucking fighting game nerds losing their fucking mind. They're like, bro, this music doesn't fit Mortal Kombat. And it's like, shut the fuck up, nerds. Yes, he is. There's no controversy around it anymore. Basically, the controversy on the internet is completely fizzled out and died. It's an insanely best-selling game. It's an incredibly lengthy RPG. It's action-based. It's fun. It's chill. If you like the wizarding world, it's amazing. But for most people, yeah. Was that? Hold on. Let's see. I got to check now. It was definitely this one. It was definitely this one. I'm looking to see if I can find the people bitching about it. But now, now everybody's looking back on it with nostalgia. Fight. It was this trailer, dude. I'm telling you. This is the trailer people bitched about. I'm gonna tell you that you're not my competition. I'm always win. Throw me in and I'm going in. I ain't running. I'm coming to you. We need to get to talk about it because I really live it. All the nights on the mission. No fear. No hope in my vision. Don't need no intervention. You wait on the ride. There ain't even no words to come out. Point them out and they all gonna be missing. Y'all wonder why I'm still here. Cause I'm doing on the dark. Like a fool if you met me. You tried to be brave and step up. But your crew is too scary. Plus I'm too legendary. It's what we go hard for. I'm rocking your block. You want to you get knocked off. I'm taking your place. Yeah, I'm making my property. Maybe a game that you probably disover your life for me. So it's only right for me. Annihilate him if they get my way of sight You can't keep him up off of me A weakness in you won't make an appetite Anytime I get into it, I be looking at him Looking pitiful in the condition that be critical Nothing less than original What's the worst of the interview? Who's next? 
But yeah, this is the one that everybody was bitching about. They're like, oh my god, bro, Wiz Khalifa doesn't belong in a Mortal Kombat trailer. And then they had like a whole fucking hissy fit about it that they should have used video game soundtracks. And it's like, these motherfuckers don't realize what a fucking trailer is supposed to do. A trailer is supposed to bait the normies. You know, motherfuckers that are already, like, die-hard Mortal Kombat fans are gonna buy that shit regardless of what the fucking trailer looks like. Trailers exist to attract people that aren't going to buy the game by default. So by putting popular music in trailers, you attract the normie audience. But these fucking dweebs were like, they could've used this soundtrack and all that type of shit. But yeah... I don't know, bro. Shit was sad. There's a group that are watching me play it, but it's certainly not as many as at first. Remember, when I was playing that game at first, every time we had three, four, five hundred people on stream, and now we barely can retain like 250. Why? Because it's a lengthy RPG. This is the problem with lengthy RPGs. The first week or two you play them, great. And then after that, everything just tapers off as everyone else has either moved on or they're playing it at their own pace or they're slowly watching it on demand. And I was like, you just give up. You're not going to spin this positively. You're doing something negative. There's something that people don't want. No one's confused about what you're doing. There's no confusion here. We know what you're doing. And no one likes it. You're just going to lose customers because of it. So just deal with it. Just stop with the coping. Okay? Well, let's be honest. The hype has died out, right? It's a longer game. I'm worth over 30 hours in. The playthrough's probably going to be 40 to 50 hours long. So, yeah, I hear you. Now, DSP Reacts has done really well. Okay? But that's not here. All right. For everybody saying that it's Mortal Kombat 11, literally look at this shit. The Mortal Kombat X teaser is everything wrong with modern trailers. So for everybody saying that there was no backlash to this trailer, cope. There literally was fucking articles written about people bitching about how the trailer was like a bad representation of the game. It didn't fit. So thank you, I know that Mortal Kombat 11 also has the exact same criticism about it, but it was not just that game. Mortal Kombat 10 had the same people bitching. Right? That's a different channel. It's people enjoying the content over there, watching and supporting it. I really appreciate you, go, you know, going to the new channel and giving it a look. That's youtube.com forward slash at DSP Reacts. Thanks for checking it out, and uh, thank you for everything there. But here... Let's be honest, okay? Hold on, my neck is very stiff today. Hmm. Let's be honest. Things kind of stagnated here on DSP Gaming. I know it is. Dude, the reason why the Mortal Kombat 11 trailer and shit had more hate is because that's when they were also nerfing the tits on the character models. That's the reason why Mortal Kombat 11 had more backlash is because they were reducing the sexuality of the characters in that game. That was the main cause of controversy for Mortal Kombat 11. That the streams still did pretty good. You know, pretty good viewership uh, and good support, good engagement, everything good. But the Yo, I think video quartering, hold on, let me check. I think quartering even made a video on that shit. Mortal Kombat 11 quartering. Yeah, there you go. The double standards of Mortal Kombat 11 and censorship in video games. <laughs> That's what I thought, man. <laughs> That's what I thought. Also, yeah, there was the Trump controversy, too. Oh, shit. Wait, we need to watch that. Does he still have that up? Well, here's Geeks and Gamers. That's just as equally bad. Does this news surprise anyone? If this news surprises you, you have not been paying attention to this channel for the last year and a half. Because we have continued to try to tell you this is exactly what's going on in the entertainment industry. And there are people out there that just choose not <laughs> to believe it. Well, it's happening. It is happening. And if you are not surprised by this news, then you have been paying attention. 
Mortal Kombat 11 has a make out world great again Trump reference. <gasps> who makes the reference? Oh, you guessed it. Oh, you guessed it. Mortal Kombat 11 is already controversial, but not for the reasons that fans of the ultra violent series might expect. NetherRealm's latest entry in the franchise has already come under fire for the designs of its female characters, with the studio having moved away from the sexualized depictions of women on its roster. See? Um, now, a scene depicting the villainous Shao Kahn making reference to Donald Trump is doing the rounds online, with the character stating his intentions to make Outworld great again. In the scene, Shao Kahn urges Mortal Kombat 11 newcomer collector to let us make Outworld great again, which is presumably a reference to the U.S. President's 2016 campaign slogan, Make America Great Again. The reference wasn't lost on Mortal Kombat fans, who promptly begin sharing the scenes on Twitter. And, I mean, I'm not going to show the clip because I don't know what they're what they're going to do. But Because but <laughs> it makes it look like a fucking joke? I mean, you've seen all the controversy with that. But, I mean, they make the villain of the game say this. Entertainment is not about entertaining anymore. Entertainment is about pushing political and social ideology. <laughs> That's all it is. That's all it is. I don't understand what's wrong with these people. But if they can <laughs> Yeah, they're the ones who have something wrong with them. If they continue to get our money, if they continue to make profit, then they're going to continue to do this. Trump has driven these people absolutely crazy. They're crazy. Ab yeah, they're the crazy ones. Absolutely crazy. And I mean, I just don't I don't <laughs> If you're surprised by this, then you probably should be watching this channel because you don't agree with anything I say and you are lost in your own little utopia that you've created for yourself where every Oh no, dude, I'm lost in my own little utopia. Thing is wonderful and it's perfect and you just don't want to pay attention to the obvious things that is right in front of your face and that's fine. You continue to live in that place. We will continue to live in the real world where the entertainment industry is completely woke where all of these companies are so concerned with pushing their ideology and not just giving good storytelling and honoring any of the mythology or the storytelling of the games or the movies or the TV shows that they are involved in. Oh so my God, what a fucking dweeb. Of everything that we've been saying. And I just, it's unbelievable, man. It's unbelievable that, that, that people aren't catching, like some people out there refuse to believe this. It's happening. It's happening all across our entertainment. Either you can believe it or you can't, but don't tell me it's not happening. What do you guys think about this craziness? Uh, <laughs> I just don't know, man. It's just un. It's. I know what the quarterings video was. Whatever. You guys have a great day. I we'll remember it now. Fuck. Can I type? Yeah, there it is. Mortal Kombat 11 injects Trump as villain and reviews tank over politics and microtransactions. <laughs> oh, man. It makes Trump the villain. How sad, bro. But yeah, that's what I remember. That's the video I was looking for. Jesus Christ, dude. What a great time to be alive, guys. Just the big issues are being addressed. Videos have dwindled here. And the question is why? Because everything's a long, ongoing RPG playthrough. Seriously, like, when every game is the same kind of a game. Even though you might argue, well, like... Well, Phil, that's because you make every game long and drawn out because you refuse to let people talk about anything other than the fucking game. Like a Dragon Ishin isn't necessarily the same as Hogwarts, isn't necessarily the same as Oblivion. I mean, you're right. But you do have to understand, they all are kind of the same style of game. Open world, you know, going around doing random side quests, you know, a little bit of plot development here or there, not really too difficult. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I, and I hear that. What we need is variety. The good news is, starting tomorrow, we're getting big variety here on DSP Gaming because tomorrow is the premiere of Wolong Fallen Dynasty. That's how they are. Me? I'm not like that. I'm a variety streamer, and I have the ability to put out whatever I want. And have fun doing it and have a core fan base who watch me play no matter what I fucking play. This game is going to probably be very difficult 
those of you who are people who come to the channel to see me fail, basically now, you know what I'm saying? The Elden Ringas have returned. They can now go like this. I mean, y'all got to watch me fail plan that shit. So, yeah. Brittany D with the two. I'm sorry, Brittany Dick. Forgive. Meanwhile, Hippozone to make gaming great again. And he did before he left, man. So sad. I miss him every day. In their hands the day. Wait, oh wait, he's not playing Elden Ring. He's playing a different game. Similar. It's like Sekiro, you know what I'm saying? But that whole group should be satiated now. Those who don't care about the slow burn RPG, the chill atmosphere, they want rage. They want challenge. They want fails. You're going to get that starting tomorrow. I mean, I've had to play it all day tomorrow, okay? And Dizzy Kid for the $5 tip and, uh, you know, $21 out of the $100 tips go pretty slow. Not going to lie. Those are, those are contributions from the pre-stream. So, hope you guys are liking the stream. You guys seem to be saying, here's the thing. When I play a Soulsborne game, here's the truth of the matter. If I'm struggling and I'm failing and I'm swearing and I'm losing my mind, oh, all the trolls love it. Ha, ha, ha. Well, now guess what? I'm doing good. I'm learning. I'm actively doing well. Oh, this is boring, man. It's like, well, so you, if I play like a normal person who learns and does well, that's not acceptable, right? You, you, you're here to see me fail. Well, you, you fuck off. You're here for the wrong reason. You're a negative dick. And sorry that I'm not going to be failing every moment playing Neo 2. I'm actually doing pretty good right now. I'm sure I'm going to lose a lot and die a lot coming up, especially when they introduce new enemies and new gameplay elements. But for now, I kind of know what I'm doing and I'm doing well. Deal with it. <clears throat> I'm not a sellout. I'm not a shill. Okay. What was the other exciting thing we did in February? The Super Bowl. Okay. Excuse me. The Super Saturday Marathon event. God forbid someone say Super Bowl because everyone's afraid they're going to get sued for saying Super Bowl because I guess it is a trademarked term. I get <laughs> Oh, no. The NFL will come after you because you did a stream about the Super Bowl even though I didn't have any Super Bowl content in it. So. That was exciting. Apparently, Trump compared himself to Thanos or a villain like Thanos once. He probably saw Thanos' dick pic. What happened? What happened? I don't know what happened. I don't know what they expected me to do there. They, if they what? blocked it, I have no control over that, right? This is the classic NES case of a game that starts off fun, and immediately it gets insanely difficult on the second fucking part, and it's not fun anymore. What the fuck? Look, no one can catch this guy, right? Like, no one. No, no, we can't catch him. Look. Like, literally no one can catch him. What a piece of shit game. Looks like somebody could catch him. <laughs> okay, that's Tecmo Ball. I hope you guys liked it. It's a piece of shit. No, really, it's, it's outdated as fuck. It's not very good. By the way, Snowcrawl says he's trying to... <laughs> Isn't that the point of playing an old game? That it's outdated? Like, the fuck? The tip he can't block? That's not... Not, not gonna lie, Chad. Griffin once showed us Thanos stick on stream once. That's right. Somebody posted it in Discord when I had it pulled up on the screen. I'm glad it left a uh, lasting impression, Britt. I'm glad it made you happy. That's on you, because I'm looking here, and some people have tipped already this morning, no problem. Like, as, as much as... Dude, this would be like me firing up, like, fucking Pong or some shit, and be like, bro, why do the graphics suck? It's two minutes ago, so it sounds like this is an issue on your end, Snow Carl, but this happened before, right? Maybe something to do with your... Bro, what the fuck is this art in the background? Like, what the fuck is that shit? An obese old man riding a bike with fucking filthy frank in his pink guy suit like coming up to like beat him up like what the fuck bank yeah it's it's not on my end because people are tipping fine no problems okay yeah so again and you know that's fine you know I, i'm not i don't think he's trying to distract me or anything here i think he's genuinely concerned no you have a tip that came through um so that all that being said here's the thing members goals were great just like sub goals were great over on Twitch. On Twitch, it was easy to maintain a subscriber count. Being honest, it really wasn't that much work. Here on YouTube, it's been like pulling teeth to get people to become members. It's hard. 
to get people to become a member on YouTube. And for two years, I've been struggling with this. Sometimes, yeah, because you don't get a free like membership for having YouTube Premium like you do with Amazon Prime. We make great strides, and then it just kind of goes back to zero. What I would say is now, looking at how things are going, looking at history, I think we have around 350 people who really like the content here and would be willing to be an ongoing member. That's what I think. And then I think every month, dependent on what we've been doing, some months you're going to get more if there's more appealing games and more appealing things going on. <clears throat> he had that frame on his wall when he used to live in his condo. Wow, man. Some beautiful art. Some months you're going to get less. Now, to some extent, I would say, I do feel there have been months where I was going to do a really interesting goal. Like, oh, we hit members this month. I'm going to do a special marathon. The only thing I have on my wall is my Pokemon cards. And that marathon kind of appealed to everyone. And everyone was very excited. Excited, excuse me. And said, yeah, let's do it, right? So I really feel that. But the other thing is, I feel like there's some months that maybe it doesn't work out like that. All right? I think February was one of those months where some people really liked the idea. But it wasn't enough of an idea to really get people to jump out and say, let's become a member. All right? Especially if they already weren't or whatever. And let's... No, it's not that. It's that you literally kept adjusting your goal upward when most of your memberships were fucking gifted. So the only way you would ever keep increasing your membership count is if people kept increasing the number of memberships they gifted every single month, which is not fucking realistic. You got rid of your Pokemon poster? Let's just say it took some collateral damage, and I had to get rid of it. Let's be honest. Usually... We get people who would be coming here on the stream and once a month they come and donate a lot of memberships. That didn't happen in February. Why? Who knows? It's not my, my place to, to question. If you have a generous person who comes every month and donates and they don't do it one month, that's their prerogative. I'm not going to sit here and be angry about it. Do I have the Mew card from the movies? Ancient Mew? Yeah, I have a PSA 9 copy of every single variant. Yup. Maybe they didn't like the content. Maybe they're just done and they moved on. They don't even want I have a copy of each variant of it. I have the original Japanese version with the Nintendo error. I have the corrected version, which is the most expensive version. Then I have the second Japanese version, which is similar to the one we got in the U.S., only it has Cosmos foil. And then I have the U.S. version and the Korean version that came out. Or no, I don't think it's Korean. It's actually Japanese. It came out in 2019 watch the channel anymore right who knows what it could be it's not my place you know to really be to judging or even asking the question all i can tell you is overall support was good in february it absolutely was at a month typically the months of january and february are some of the slowest of the year because ad revenue on youtube is way down like abysmally down all the companies blew their ads in the in the, the the winter there, the end of the winter, you know, Christmas season. Why are you fucking surprised by that? That's literally how it is every single year. <clears throat> now what's going to happen is March, April, things do start to pick up a bit here again. So ad revenue kind of becomes a factor again, which is good. But overall, you guys supported both DSP Gaming and a whole new channel. And I couldn't be ha happier. Like, I'm really happy. It, look, we didn't hit the members goal, but that's not the end of everything. It's not. It didn't end everything. You acted like it was the end of the fucking world when you weren't about to hit it. Now it's not a big deal, though. Everything. I'm excited for a new month of content. Now, here's the thing. When something like this happens, you got to reassess. And I started taking in feedback. And you guys, actually, I would like to say this. You guys left me a bunch of comments. And a few people wrote me emails. And I appreciate this because I take in all of your feedback, all of your criticism, constructive and otherwise, although the constructive is what really... Yeah, right. ...really is effective. Otherwise, I just laugh and delete. I'm going to say a bunch of things. You're a piece of shit. I don't like your content. Why'd you write me an email? You're stupid. Anyway. So that being said, um, I've listened to your feedback and here's what we've concluded. All right? Here's what we've concluded. People will become members and donate memberships and do member bombs if they feel like <clears throat> they really like what's going on. It's not necessarily always tied to a special event. It might be. It very well might be. But in this case, because I have a new YouTube channel called DSP Reacts, where I've already announced once a month we're doing a major React Marathon event, that was one of the major reasons why in the last year people were actually contributing. And now that I'm giving it to you for free over there on a new channel, well, a lot of people aren't going to be becoming a member anymore. And that's okay, 
as long as all the content continues to get supported in other ways. The streams are doing very well, right? I think viewership should pick up in March as I start playing a variety of different games, okay? So as long as we can keep it all going, it's not a big deal, <clears throat> okay? Now, that means, obviously, if I'm not going to be really harping and focusing on members anymore, then we probably shouldn't have member goals. What's the point if I'm... Yeah, we got to double down on the tips goals. Not if I really... Because I can use that money now and YouTube doesn't take a cut. That's what I never understood, man. It's like, why did he always push so hard for memberships? It never really made sense. Like, he's already accepting tips and he gets to keep all the money from tips. So wouldn't you think he wouldn't want YouTube taking a 30% cut? Like, I don't fucking know. I never really got that. Really not finding a way to actively convince everyone to become a member. Right? Why am I going to sit here and talk about, oh, the members go to... I guess he was hoping, like, it would turn into monthly recurring revenue and people would just forget about it and leave it on indefinitely. The members go to members go every month. What's the point? Right? And what I have to understand, actually, some people gave me some really good feedback. They said, here's what some people do. If things are going well for them, if they're feeling an overwhelming amount of support and positivity, they'll, they'll schedule special events and just do them for fun. Fun. It's fun. Look, it's fun. No, really, guys, it's fun. Now, the other thing is, if you have feedback in regards to, oh, I feel like this would be make a membership more appealing or whatever, please share the feedback. But understand that if you just repeat the same thing we've heard ad nauseum that we can't do, that's just going to be ignored. I've already addressed many different things that people have said, including yes, the whole can we do a multiplayer session fan service? No, it's, it doesn't make sense. It takes up too much time from the stream for people who aren't members. People don't really care about it. The logistics are a nightmare, and the trolls will ruin it. I already answered it. I don't have to answer it 400 times. You see? Shut up. No one cares about you, boy. I really <laughs> feel like the days of members being a big concern, like freaking out about it, boy. that doesn't make sense. Why are we going to freak out about the members' goals and talk about it? And then the other thing is, as you know, my detractors then make it, oh, you see? Today was just a big failure for Phil because he didn't hit his members goal. Well, it wasn't at all. <laughs> nothing nothing was ruined. Nothing ended. Was it, you know what I mean? Again, the chicken Hope little warning. in the sky is falling. Hope no, warning. nothing went Hope warning. Well, It's not a big deal. In fact, there's been many months in the past, even on Twitch when I was a bigger streamer, that we didn't hit our goal. And that's fine. You're not going to do it all the time. You know what I'm saying? Snowcrawl, please stop trying to de de seriously stop trying to derail the stream at this point. <laughs> I mean it. Like, you gotta stop. Because what you're saying is nonsense because six minutes later someone else tipped, so. <laughs> Seriously, you have to stop with the nonsense, okay? But yeah, I haven't, I haven't gotten far enough in the, the missions of the game. <clears throat> Retro Jim says, do you think Snowcrawl's overly enthusiastic with suggestions, but he may mean well? It doesn't, it actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's well-intentioned or not. He's annoying, and he has to understand that, and he has to stop. He has to learn. He can't just keep distracting me and pissing me off during streams. I have to be able to That's put right, out man. a fun and productive stream for everyone and not get annoyed every five seconds by something he says. So he needs to fucking chill out. This month, all right, I'm going to have to start taking a little bit of time away from streaming every once in a while. I'm going to explain why in a moment. You know, when it comes to the big picture, okay? Uh, some months, ad revenue is great from those on-demand viewers. Some months, it's not. Because it really depends on the time of year. Here's what I will say. Here's what I will strongly recommend. And I've been trying to push this because I really do feel this is the wave of the future for YouTube. If you like my content and you don't want to have to worry about any kind of bullshit or anything like that, a really great way to support this channel is becoming a YouTube Premium subscriber. That's because right. You watch my content with YouTube Premium. Just listen to this. It doesn't matter if my video has ads enabled or has been flagged as not ad suitable. All right? I still get credit for your view and I still make something on it. Yes, YouTube premium members actually help no matter what, just through their views. As opposed to everyone else, <clears throat> yeah, it's intrusive when you see ads and shit. I know that. And, you know, if you become a YouTube premium member, you don't have to see those ads. But if there's no ads enabled, you still get credit for it anyway, <clears throat> which is amazing. This week, Sunday night, I have to take off from streaming. <laughs> oh my god. And it's for 
and absolutely, positively, 100%, awful, 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 awful reason. It's some of the worst news you could ever hear. It's like, it's debilitating. It t it's, it's depressing. It's very sad news. I wish I didn't have to share it with you. All right? Seriously, I really do. I wish that this was something that I could just ignore. But sadly, it's not. Ladies and gentlemen, this Sunday night, I got to do my initial work on my taxes. <gasps> what a fucking idiot. <laughs> Damn, he put that shit off, bro. What a complete... I've already done my taxes. Idiot. Which means I got to scan a ridiculous amount of documents. It means that I've got to sign agreements. It means that I've got to do this and that. And I got to get it done. I kind of procrastinated because I could have done it in February and I didn't. And now if I don't start doing this, I'm never going to get it done. And the thing is, you might say, well, why don't you do it outside of the streams? Because it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's all this tax documents need to be scanned and sent over. And then I have to si read and sign a big agreement. And I have to put in all basic information. It's not even doing my taxes. It's the work to start doing my taxes. Jackie Smurf, I wish. He says, perhaps by next year we can save up enough to not only get past tax stuff and everything, but pay for a honeymoon. My problem is, I don't even have enough for tax stuff. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm barely getting by paying bills, and I know I'm going to have more problems later this year with taxes and stuff. It's just, it's like an endless cycle, you know? It, it, it... I wonder why, man. I mean, that's what happens when you go several hundred thousands of dollars into debt, right? It potentially, it looks like it could be years and years until I'm in a situation where I'm not in that kind of a situation, and maybe I can actually do something, like go on a vacation, but... Not anytime soon. We're talking years and years, man. You know, it just sucks. But that's that's my life. That's my dude. It fucking sucks having to put the money aside because then you have to write this big ass check every single quarter, and you just watch your account balance just drop. Like I, f I strongly believe if we did not withhold taxes from people's paychecks, and they actually had to write checks to the IRS paying their taxes and watch that money leave their account, there would not be a single person in this country that would actually vote for fucking taxes. Because it is the most just awful feeling on planet Earth when you have to fucking write tax checks to the fucking IRS and watch this massive amount of money leave your account and literally get nothing from it. My reality, I just gotta, I gotta deal with it. It is fucking AIDS, bro. It's one of the worst feelings you'll ever fucking experience. Hands down. Hands fucking down. I don't know. Let's see how people like Wo Long review. I'm just curious. Hong Jing? At this point, it's probably fair to say that Team Ninja has a pretty good handle on this whole Souls-like genre thing. Wo Long Fallen Dynasty may not reach the same heights as Neo 2 did back in 2020, but it certainly scratches that same itch of lightning fast combat, punishing yet rewarding difficulty, and deep build customization options that you can craft and tailor to your own playstyle. And it accomplishes that feat while completely changing up the fundamentals of its combat system to be closer to Sekiro than Dark Souls. By that same token, boo. Token, it also falls victim to the same familiar issues nagging at those other Team Ninja Souls likes, including subpar storytelling and excessively fiddly loot mechanics. But when you consider the things that Wu Long does better than just about any other game in this genre. That baggage amounts to scratches on an otherwise pristine set of armor. If you're familiar with the Three Kingdoms era of Chinese history, you may get more out of Wulong's story than I did. My knowledge basically begins and ends with the fact that you should not pursue Lu Bu. Lu Bu? Who the fuck is but Lu Bu? Even then, I think it won't be a highlight because Team Ninja continues to struggle with telling a memorable story with likable characters. This is a supernatural take on the final days of the Han Dynasty, where we take control of a nameless warrior who gets swept up in a power struggle between warring kingdoms and their pursuit of an elixir of immortality. 
In practically every mission, you team up with some sort of historically significant warrior it's to fight Lou through Boo. a level, have a boss battle against an evil or corrupted historically significant warrior, and then move on to the next one. Characters are introduced at a rapid-fire pace and leave the scene just as quickly, often without making any sort of impact on the overall story. Sometimes they return many hours later, but I'd already forgotten them because they didn't really do anything meaningful. Fortunately, the actual gameplay in between the cutscenes make up the vast majority of what we're here to do, and it's there that Wolong shines the brightest. Wolong's combat is a puzzle that needs to be figured out really quickly if you plan on getting past even the first major boss. But once you solve it, dog. it's incredibly satisfying to play around it. Similar to Sekiro. You know, I could understand that. If you like the style of combat this game has, and you get used to the uh, countering system, or parrying, whatever the fuck you want to call it, it probably is fun. But I don't like countering and parrying. I just like the dodge roll, bro. I don't like Souls likes that force you to pick a play style. I like to be able to choose my play style however I want to. I want to be able to approach a boss however I want to. I don't like waiting for a boss to present me with the correct button prompt so that I can actually attack them. Bro, it's a system that relies on carefully timing deflections so you can preserve your spirit meter while also avoiding damage especially when enemies also start mixing in powerful, unblockable attacks that have to be parried rather than blocked. Crucially though, you can completely negate damage from regular attacks just by holding down the block button. So long- What? Nika, you- Since fucking when? As long as you have enough spirit built up to avoid having your guard broken. You can even hold down the block button while also attempting to deflect, making it so that even if you're too late on the deflection timing, you'll still block the attack. It's a good thing that Wolong has this leniency built in, because in practically every other regard, it doesn't pull any punches. Enemies will regularly power through your attack- It's L1? Bro, it never fucking told me that shit. ...to deal a more powerful blow of their own, they have combos that go on for days, and they do a really good job at varying up the rhythm of their attacks to try and bait you into parrying too early. It rewards a careful eye and punishes falling into a predictable rhythm. Even with all that though, it's not nearly as hard as Neo 2, for reasons I'll get to later. But it still manages to find a really satisfying balance of being tough, fair, and absolutely exhilarating once you start to pick up on an enemy's attack patterns and find yourself deflecting each hit of an incoming combo. One clever wrinkle is that your spirit meter is also a resource that can be spent on spells, special martial arts abilities, and spirit attacks. It's a nice risk-reward mechanic that lets you put yourself in a potentially more vulnerable position in order to gain some sort of advantage. If you know an enemy has an elemental weakness, for instance, you can exploit that by spending spirit to enchant your weapon with an element to stagger and quickly break them. Martial arts abilities are unique depending on the weapon that you're wielding. And there are many that offer powerful attacks that can either do big single target damage or give you a way to deal with- Yeah, I don't know, man. I just don't like this shit where you have to, like, build up the fucking meter and then you can actually deal damage. Like, I just don't like that shit, personally. Because it, like, really restricts how you play the game. Like, it just puts you on fucking standby waiting for the enemy to finally decide to use the specific move you want so that you can actually deal damage to them. I don't like that style of boss fight. That's like incredibly boring to me. Like that's literally what Sekiro is. And that's why I didn't like Sekiro. Many enemies at once. Finally, spirit attacks are powerful strikes that increase in damage the more spirit you have built up, which gives you another reason to try to hold onto your spirit meter until you need it. If it's not already clear, there are tons of layers to Wolong's combat, which greatly enhances the already excellent swordplay by laying out a ton of options and ways to vary up my strategy whenever I found myself dying repeatedly to a particular boss. If just straight up attacking didn't work, I could focus more on defense and reduce their spirit by deflecting big attacks. Failing that, I could double down on rushing them down and trying to break their spirit with aggressive attacks and martial arts abilities. Or if I could figure out what they're weak to, I could try using spells. So while Wolong is certainly tough, I never felt like I was ever stuck against a wall with no idea of what else I could try or how to overcome a particular challenge. 
Where Wolong feels very similar to the previous three Team Ninja Souls likes in a bad way is in its loot. More specifically, there's an overabundance of it. I became absolutely inundated with garbage gear that I had no use for within just a few hours. <laughs> Holy and only fuck, got worse man. After that. I'm just not the kind of person who really wants to spend 10 to 15 minutes in the menu trying to decipher whether a minus 2.6 reduction in martial arts spirit is worth sacrificing a 7.2 genuine chi obtention. Holy Those simply aren't fuck, interesting man. decisions. Those are spreadsheet entries and math problems. And it's made worse by not even being able to sort your massive list of weapons by set or by a specific special effect that you're looking for. Now, I am fully aware that there are people who love these games for this level of hyper-specific build optimization. Autistic and detail, you, you mean. You'll find a lot to appreciate here. You can salvage junk gear to extract their special effects, then slot those special effects into weapons that you want to use, and then you can copy the appearance of any weapon or armor, so you don't have to worry about being forced to use an ugly weapon or armor set because it has great stats. It's fairly exhaustive in its options, but it's also not for those of us who prefer action to menu screens. Fortunately, I found that I didn't have to get too far into the weeds on my first playthrough because I was more than powerful enough just by engaging with loot on a surface level. No major tweaking was necessary to keep me from falling behind the power curve. Leaving the complexity for those who are looking to test their metal in the multiple iterations of New Game Plus or PvP invasions. One of my favorite new ideas in Wolong is the addition of morale ranks, which is basically a separate progression system that starts at zero at the beginning of every main mission and goes all the way up to 25. You gain morale simply by defeating enemies, but you'll gain it even faster by killing them using spirit attacks, martial arts abilities, or critical strikes. You will also lose some morale every time you die, up to a certain point determined by your fortitude level, which you can increase by finding various flagpoles throughout each mission. Enemies have morale ranks too, and those with a higher rank than you deal more damage. I love this addition because it gives every level a very natural... They really added level-based combat to a fucking Souls game? Ew. Okay, that's disgusting. Why the fuck is that a thing? Level-based combat in a Souls game? That's gonna be a no for me, dog. ...ramp up in difficulty while adding extra incentive to explore and mop up more bad guys. Each level begins fairly easy. A bunch of low morale rank enemies make up the majority of foes, with a few high ranked monsters sprinkled here and there to give you an occasional challenging fight. By the time you're near the end of the level though, you're regularly going up against rank 20 enemies and bosses that will be really tough to deal with if you haven't been thorough in cleaning out the opposition. Much like Neo, Wo Long's campaign is broken up into main missions and side missions, with the main missions taking you through humongous levels, from castles to active battlefields to jails with Dark Souls-like poison pawns on the ground floor, and the side missions typically having you revisit those settings with some sort of fun twist with regard to the objective and enemy placements. Some of my favorite side missions even have you sparring against your allies in challenging boss battles. One of the really great things that Wolong does... Yeah, I don't know, man. Just watching this, it doesn't look like the game changes at all. It's literally just fucking counter-spamming. That's literally what this shit looks like. ...is that it allows you to exit out of the mission from a battle flag and save your progress on that main mission. This is a wonderful safety net, because frequently what can happen in these games is you can find yourself underleveled and stuck on a main mission. Here, you're allowed to back out to the level select, complete some side missions to level up or get new gear, maybe head to your secret village home base to upgrade that gear, and then return right to where you left off on that main mission without feeling like you've lost your hard-fought progress. The levels themselves won't win any awards for how they look, but they're all very well designed from a gameplay perspective. Branching paths that often allow you to find an easier way through a particularly tough area and tons of easily missable optional detours leading to bountiful rewards keep them from being straightforward paths from point A to point B. Wolong's biggest problem, bigger than the loot issues and the poor storytelling, is its enemy variety. Even though the combat system is excellent and varied, there's simply not enough different types of opponents to fill a game of this size. The ones that are here are fantastic and fun to fight, don't get me wrong, but part of the fun of a Souls-like is encountering a new threat, learning their attack patterns, 
and finding a way to get through the fight without taking heavy damage. In Wolong, I felt like I figured out everything I needed to know to get through every non-boss encounter by hour 5 of a game that, in total, took me about 22 hours to beat. That took out a lot of the tension and fear of death that these games thrive on. Without the anxiety that something unexpected might be lying in wait around the next corner, Wolong is still a very challenging game, but one that lacks a certain sense of adventure. It's also worth mentioning that Wolong also includes online co-op for up to three players, an extensive new game plus for those who want to min-max their characters to the extreme, and even has PvP invasions, which you can opt out of if you'd prefer to deal with relatively easy AI invaders. Unfortunately, not enough people were playing ahead of launch for me to test the competitive multiplayer features out for this review, but cooperative play is super easy to set up and play through, just like it's been in prior Team Ninja Souls likes. You can either recruit random strangers into your game from within a level when you need help, or you can start a level fresh from the beginning with a friend. Yeah, I don't know, man. The more and more I see of this, the more I really don't want to go back to it, because like, I was kind of tempted to go and see if I could beat the boss, but now... I don't really care, because it just doesn't look like it gets any better. It looks like the exact same shit. You know, counter-attack, 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 counter-attack. Oh, red attack, counter, then you can actually deal damage. Like, it just looks so repetitive. <laughs> Long Fallen Dynasties. No, it's not like every Souls game. No, Dark Souls is way more varied in its combat. Combat plays very differently from Team Ninja's own Neo games. Sekiro, though, is not. But I would say Sekiro's gameplay is a lot deeper than this. More in the mold of Sekiro than Dark Souls. And yet, it manages to excel and falter in just about the same areas. When it comes to the clashing of melee weapons, Wo Long is among the best in the genre. Full stop. The options for taking down its ferocious enemies are many and immensely rewarding to master, and its deflection-heavy combat is one of the most satisfying since Sekiro. All of those strengths outweigh an overbearing loot system, poor storytelling, and even a disappointing lack of variety in enemies. If not for that, Wolong might have been one of Team Ninja's greatest achievements. As it is, it's simply a great one. They consider 8 to be great? I would consider that to be good, if not just, like, okay. Seven, I would consider to be average. Six, I would consider to be boring. Five, I would consider to be functional. And then anything below that is when you get into the area of this game doesn't fucking work. I can't afford but yeah, an eight, I would not consider to be great. I would say that's, like, decent. It's okay. Yeah, that's the thing, is Sekiro feels a lot more in-depth. But, I don't know, man. It, this game, like, I don't like the control scheme, and I'm never going to be able to get over that. Because if I'm not able to, like, accidentally double-tap the bu fucking button that's literally used every half second, then, yeah, no, I'm not going to play that game. What game have I given a 10 out of 10? For Spoken, bro. Greatest game I've ever played. Same with Atomic Heart. Love those two games. But what game would I give a 10 out of 10? Um, trying to think of something recent. Shit. What's a game I would give a 10 out of 10, bro? Um... <laughs> Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood, I would give a 10 out of 10. Those games are fucking great. Uh, Bioshock, I would give a 10 out of 10. Bioshock Infinite, I would give a 10 out of 10. Borderlands 2, I would give a 10 out of 10. This game is fucking incredible. Uh, Modern Warfare 3. Dark Souls 3, easily. Uh, Dead Space Remake, I'd probably give it, like, a 9. I don't think Dead Space is completely without fault. Um, I would say Doom 2016, I'd give a 10 out of 10. Because the multiplayer was really good for it. 
Uh, Elder Scrolls, easy 10 out of 10. Elden Ring, I'd probably give it 10 out of 10. I don't think you can get much better for open world games than uh, Elden Ring. Dying Light is close. I want to give it that, but nah. I think it's like a 9. I think there's still issues I have with Dying Light. Brawl Fallout 76, 10 out of 10. Hell yeah. Final Fantasy 15, I would give it 10 out of 10. I fucking love that game. Same with Final Fantasy 7 Remake. Great games. For spoken, bro, easy. Um, none of these. None of these. Hogwarts Legacy, I'd give like a eight. Mm, mm, mm. I love Max Payne three, but it's like a nine, I would say. Hmm. Ten out of tens, huh? This game, I would give a 10 out of 10. Any day, bro. Ori in the Blind Forest? This game is fucking goaded, bro. Like, this is a 10 out of 10 game right here. 100%. If you have never played this, do yourself a favor and download this shit on Game Pass. Uh, Portal 2 is a 10 out of 10. Easily. Mmm... Rise, Son of Rome, I like a lot, but it's not a 10 out of 10. Stardew Valley, I'd probably give a 10 out of 10. I don't think you can find much better in that genre. Uh, Titanfall 1, easy 10 out of 10. That game was great. But yeah, there you go. There's some games that have a 10 out of 10. Bro, this game was really weird, but honestly, it was pretty cool back in the day. I had it on PS3. It's got a like a sexy elf archer, bro. There you guys go. That's what the uh, main character looks like. A slutty elf archer. It goes on sale for like $2, like all the fucking time. It's a decent little co-op game. I got a bunch of shit in here, bro. Oh my god, God of War is a 10 out of 10. Gears 5, 10 out of 10. Easily, bro. Far Cry 3 is close to a 10 out of 10. Except the ending kind of draws out. Dude, anime game? Let's go. Um, Dishonored's close to a 10 out of 10, but I wouldn't quite give it to it. It's a little short. Just trying to see. Castle Crashers is pretty close, too. But I got some beef with Castle Crashers. It's really boring once you beat it. There's not much to do. And you have to grind like a motherfucker to unlock characters. But yeah. There you guys go. What would you give Doom Eternal? A 9 out of 10, probably. The campaign, I would give a 10 out of 10. The campaign was fucking solid. But overall, because the multiplayer is fucking dog water, I'd give it a 9. But yeah, campaign-wise, damn near perfect. But multiplayer absolutely fucking sucked. So, can't say it's a true 10 out of 10. But campaign-wise, it is a 10 out of 10. Battlefield 2042, 10 out of 10. Hell yeah. I got a bunch of games I need to play. But like, see, I put a bunch of time into this game. See, 70 hours, bro. I put 70 hours into this fucking bitch. And, like, all of a sudden, after I got the first ending, I, um, got to this part where, like, I was way under-leveled, and then, you know. I had to stop, because I got fucking bored of grinding. Digimon sucks. Don't buy those games. But, yeah, for anybody saying that I'm a uh, fake Call of Duty fan, check out the playtime. 560 hours and the game has only been out for 
what, four months? What is Elderborn? What the fuck is this shit? <laughs> Bro, what is this? And why the fuck is it on my computer? <laughs> What the fuck is this shit? I wonder if somebody you gifted this to me. You know to what the fuck is this shit, man? I know, the music's terrible. A metal AF slasher with a brutal FPP melee combat and Souls-like RPG character progression. Dude, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I have no idea how I got this. What the fuck, man? When did this get added to my account? End of activity. It doesn't even say, like, when it was I added this shit to my account. Dude, I have no idea. That may have been one of the Humble Bundle free games or something. Like, I honestly have no idea what the fuck that is. Oh, Oblivion and Skyrim, I would give 10 out of 10s. I don't know if I mentioned those. I forgot. Oh. Dragon's Dog was really good. I would recommend playing that if you guys haven't. Play it? No, I don't want to download it. Devil May Five or Devil May Cry Five is fucking goaded. This shit's really good. I'd say that's a ten out of ten, probably. That's about as good as you can get when it comes to hack and slash. It bothers me so much that Dark Souls Remastered comes after 2 and 3. Like, just move it to the front. That shit pisses me off. Yo, you guys remember this game? It was so bad that Amazon unlisted this shit. I still have it in my library. But yeah, this game was literally so bad that Amazon literally made it so that you can't fucking download it anymore. They unreleased the game because it was so fucking bad. That shit was hilarious. I've never seen that happen before. Like, literally a couple weeks after the game. I don't even know if it was a couple weeks, but it came out during the middle of, like, the COVID lockdowns. I streamed it for, like, an hour and then stopped because it was so boring. But yeah, they unreleased it like a week later after it came out because it was such a bomb. And they were like paying Twitch streamers and shit to play it. I didn't get paid, unfortunately. I heard this game is actually really good. I should play it. Like, I'm pretty sure it's got like really good reviews. Yeah, 92% bright memory. The first game's supposed to be shit. This one... I played a little bit of it, and it was, like, really janky. But, yeah, the reviews, I don't... Oh, no, it's got pretty positive reviews. What the fuck? I guess they fixed it. Damn. Okay. It looked interesting, but it was just really bad when I played it. Borderlands 3, I never finished. I played 25 hours of it and got bored. When the f wait, why does it say it said I played 10 minutes recently, but it's his last played December 20th, 2020. That's weird. Borderlands one. Great game. Borderlands two is awesome. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I wish this game was better than it actually was. It's pretty trash. Three sixty no scope arena. Let's go, man. Game was lit as fuck.
Any other hidden gems in here? Dude, she got a dumpy. What the fuck? This game's great. If you guys have never played this, do yourself a favor and buy it now. This game was fucking fire. Absolute fire. Final Fantasy 13 is very good as well. I like it. I probably should replay it at some point. HTM 101 with a 2. I wish Final Fantasy 16 would have allowed us to swap characters. I don't know. I don't really mind, honestly. Like, I, I would rather them have, like, this more focused combat system versus, you know, swapping and, like, going through menus and shit like that. And Elijah Petty with the two have played Cyberpunk since the updates. Yeah, I hated it. You Generation got me to play it one night, and I did not enjoy it whatsoever. I uninstalled it immediately after that stream. February 2nd was when I last played it. But yeah. I did not like Cyberpunk. I literally spent most of that time skipping dialogue or listening to unskippable dialogue. Fallout 4, great game. 53 hours. Never finished it on PC. I finished it on console, I think. This game was really good, Ghost Runner. This game was really good, Get to the Orange Door. This shit's actually really fire. If you guys haven't played this, you should definitely pick it up. It's really cool. Guaca Melee. Yeah, no wonder why I didn't play that. I don't know why the fuck I even bothered redeeming that. Horizon. Oh my god. Yeah, I played 80 minutes of it and got bored. Didn't touch it again. I need to play this. The Mass Effect Legendary Edition and get some alien hoes. This game's awesome. This is like one of the best single player games you can get. If you like uh, shooting up fucking terrorists and shit. It's really fun. You get to go in and like basically gun down the Taliban. How much is this now? I'm sure. Oh, they're still trying to charge fucking 20 bucks. Damn. I wouldn't pay 20 bucks for it, but it'll probably go on sale at some point. But it's a really cool campaign. I used to play the multiplayer a lot on PlayStation 3. This game, God Tier, definitely buy it. This game, God Tier, definitely buy it. In fact, I own this game on Steam and Xbox, apparently, because it's a Play Anywhere title. So, there's that. I don't know why I have this. I think somebody gifted me this. I didn't buy it. As you can see, I've put a whopping zero minutes into it. <laughs> Love it, bro. Uh, this game's great. Saints Row the Third, Fire. I wish they would release the remastered version on a different launcher other than the Fortnite store, but I don't think we're getting that. I got this game for free. Pretty decent. What the fuck is this? I'm guessing this is another Humble Bundle game because I have a whopping zero minutes in it, but that's most of my games. Yeah, whopping zero minutes, whopping zero minutes, another whopping zero minutes, Splitgate, 100 minutes. That game was kind of weak. Dude, I should play this. This shit would be fun to play. Republic Commando. This game is great, dude. How many people play it still? Yeah, barely anybody. That's a shame. Battlefront 2 is top fucking notch. Honestly. You're not going to get much better. EA Battlefront 2 is so fucking underrated. It's criminal, dog. 
Absolutely fucking criminal. And you generation with the two plays Spec Ops the line, the game is fire. I played it on the 360. I thought it was okay. I didn't really think it was that big of a deal. Like people hyped it up acting like it was gonna be like this fucking super edgy game, and it's like you just gas some civilians. Like who fucking cares? It's a video game. This game is fucking dope. If you don't have this, it goes on sale all the time with Bayonetta. You can get the bundle for like ten bucks all the time, bro. But this is like one of the best games you'll ever fucking play. Right hand to God. 